Good afternoon and welcome to this joint hearing on committee of the Committee of Government Operations and the Committee of Criminal Justice. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, and I want to thank my co-chair, Council Member Keith Powers, who has been a strong advocate for election reform and voting rights. Today we are holding oversight on the voting rights of justice involved persons and giving a first hearing to three pieces of legislation. Two of the bills are under the Committee of Governmental Operations, Introduction 367, sponsored by Councilmember Salamanca in relation to the Department of Probation, informing persons of their voting rights, and Introduction 1115, sponsored by myself in relation to agencies assisting eligible parolees, uh, with voter registrations. The third bill, which is under the Committee of Criminal Justice, is Introduction 514 in relation to the Department, <coughs> excuse me, of Correction, informing released persons of their voting rights, and I will, leave it, I will leave it to that committee and our sponsor to discuss their bills in greater detail. There's a tremendous amount of confusion when a justice-involved person can vote, and our goal with today's hearings to discuss how we can all work together and to clear away that confusion. So, we, so when does the justice involved person lose or gain the right to vote? First, the right to vote is lost only, let me say that again, only when a person is convicted of a felony. <clears throat> Anyone convicted of a misdemeanor or is charged with a felony but still awaiting trial retains the right to vote. Anyone on probation can still vote. Before this year, a person in parole could not vote, and the right to vote was only restored after they completed their parole. However, in April of 2018, the governor issued an executive order that created a process for granting conditional pardons that restore only the right to vote. So now, so now some, not all parole, uh, parolees can vote. This is a wonderful step forward. However, for it to work, we are going to need to do a tremendous amount of public education. My own bill, Introduction 1115, approaches this issue by ensuring that staff of the agencies covered by the agency-based voter registration law, which requires agencies to assist the public in voter registration, are provided with guidance on the voting rights of formerly incarcerated persons. This guidance is to be developed by the Voter Assistant Advisory Committee. The bill will also require agencies covered by the law upon request by a parolee, parolee to check if they are eligible to register to vote. I want to thank members of both committees and the sponsors of these bills for their commitment to these issues. I also want to thank the staff of both committees, Brad Reed, Elizabeth Cronk, Zach Harris, Alana Savine, uh, Kish, Kishore uh, Denny, I, and Jen Lee, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for all their hard work. And I look forward to our discussion of these bills. And if you could uh, put your phones to silence, I would appreciate it as well. With that, I'll turn it over to our co-chair of today, uh, Keith Powers. Council Member Keith Powers. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. My name is Keith Powers. I'm the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, and as was stated, this is a joint oversight hearing between the Criminal Justice Committee and the Government Operations Committee, which I am proudly a member of both, on the important topic of voting rights for justice involved population. Of course, it's a timely hearing in light of the registration deadline coming up next Friday, I believe it is, and also our upcoming elections and our just past elections. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Cabrera, along with his staff, for helping to put this hearing together today and for everybody here for attending. Um, as many of us know, voting is a fundamental right, and we have to take efforts to ensure that all voices are counted in the electoral process, including the voices of currently and formerly incarcerated individuals. For too long, the justice-involved population has been banned from the polls, both explicitly in the state law and discreetly through misinformation or lack of information or occasionally voter suppression. And New York has a law, law has, a proportionally has proportionally de deprived communities of color the right to vote. 
As of 2010, 80% of voters excluded by the New York State law were black or Hispanic. The governor's executive order uh, earlier this year, restoring the right to vote for New Yorkers on parole is a step in the right direction and has the potential to enfranchise tens of thousands of new voters. Uh, but we need to make sure that every single person who is eligible for this benefit knows it and becomes qualified to receive it. We need to make sure that all incarcerated people who are eligible to vote not only know about their voting rights, but have meaningful access to the polls. The Departments of Correction and Probation are crucial to these efforts, and I look forward to hearing from the representatives from the DOC and the DOP to address these issues. In particular, I am interested in exploring what each agency is doing, not just to facilitate voter registration, but to encourage voter participation in local elections and generally in the political process. The Criminal Justice Committee will be hearing one piece of legislation today in our committee, Councilmember Lansman's introduction 514, which would require the DOC to distribute written notice regarding the voting rights of formerly incarcerated individuals in the state of New York upon release, along with voter registration forms. Additionally, it also required the Campaign Finance Board with the assistance of the Voter Assistancy Advisory Committee to include incarcerated and formerly incarcerated persons in activities that they currently undertake to um, uh, aimed at encouraging and facilita facilitating voter registration. Under this bill, written notice must include information regarding the date of voter eligibility, and if passed, intro number 514 would help inform justice-involved populations who have been disenfranchised due to widespread miseducation regarding voter eligibility. With that said, I want to thank all of the representatives from the administration for being here and testifying today. I want to thank my staff and my office and from the committee for helping to put this hearing together. The chair again, and thank you all council members who are here in attendance and those who are coming. Um, we are going to now, and I just want to actually recognize them, council member Holden, council member Kalman Yeager, council member Lika Amprey Samuel, council member uh, Rory Lansman, and I know we'll be joined by more uh, soon. I want to um, you give us an opportunity to hear from Councilmember Lansman on his bill uh, on today's hearing. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Councilman Rory Lansman, a member of the Criminal Justice Committee, and uh, in a different setting, I chair the Committee on the Justice System. I'm here today in support of my bill, Intro 514, to require the Department of Correction to give every person released from custody written notice of their voting rights and a voter registration form. There is a simple fact about those at Rikers that many people don't understand. Eventually, almost all of them will come home. And when they do, when they do, the overwhelming majority of them will have the right to vote, if only they knew it. New York's voting laws only bar those currently incarcerated or on parole for a felony from voting. Actually, earlier this year has been referenced, Governor Cuomo signed an executive order effectively extending voting rights to more than 35,000 people on parole. We know from efforts around the country that the opportunity to vote and have a voice in government decreases recidivism because of the greater investment that offenders feel in their communities and the laws that govern them. But having the right to vote and knowing how to use it are two different things. My bill will bring those polls closer together and, as a consequence, make our city more democratic, more engaged, and more safe. Thank you. Councilmember Salamanca is one of the sponsors of the bill. He had a conflict, uh, last minute conflict, uh, with his schedule. So I'm going to be reading briefly uh, his statement. I'd like to thank the chair and committees for holding a hearing on this important issue today. When I was campaigning for the presidential election two years ago, encouraging everyone in my community to vote, I ran into numerous people in my district who told me, I have a record, or I have a misdemeanor or felony, so I cannot vote. I will tell them, yes, you can vote, but it became clear to me that we needed to inform the formerly incarcerated or those in parole of their rights. It is their right to vote, and they need to know that. Stated in intro 367, Department of Probation and, or relevant, relevant agencies should issue a written notice on the voting rights of persons sentenced to probation in the state of New York. Communities of color, like the one I represent, feel this heavy burden. The issue of mar mass incarceration in our nation largely affects our black and brown community, 
and with the pervasive misunderstanding of who can and can, can't vote, it is on us to educate and improve voter turnout. I believe that creating or instilling, instilling a sense of civic efficacy can begin at a very basic level. Calling your elected official, attending a community board uh, hearing, and voting. Integrating back into a community can begin with feeling like you have a voice. And in this case, casting a vote can be that voice. We should be encouraging part participation in government at whatever level. Thank you for your time, and please do not hesitate to reach out to my office with any questions or concern. This is by Council Member Rafael Salamanca, Jr. And with that, we'll be serving in the administration. If everyone could raise their right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? You could begin, and uh, if you could please introduce yourselves. Good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Cabrera, and members of the Criminal Justice and Governmental Operations Committees. I am Jorge Fanjul, Senior Advisor for Democracy NYC at the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives. I am here today to provide some brief introductory remarks on the Democracy NYC initiative aimed at increasing civic engagement for all New Yorkers, including some of our most vulnerable justice-involved individuals. As an overview, Democracy NYC was first announced by Mayor Bill de Blasio in this year's State of the City Address and it detailed a robust plan to make New York City the fairest, most civically engaged big city in America. Earlier this year, Philip Thompson was appointed the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives and charged with overseeing the Democracy NYC initiative. The administration also made a commitment to create the role of Chief Democracy Officer to help manage the initiative. We're happy to say that the city's first Chief Democracy Officer, Irene Fonseca Sabuni, started on Monday. She is a former civil and human rights lawyer and will be charged with everything from voter drives to a new civics curriculum for New York City public schools, and yes, even making sure that the voting rights of justice-involved people are a priority in the work that the city does. This summer, Democracy NYC partnered with the Department of Corrections, the New York City Board of Elections, the Campaign Finance Board's NYC Votes, the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit, the Legal Aid Society, NYCLU, and NYCLU to run a voter registration and absentee ballot drive on Rikers Island. An unprecedented level of cooperation and effort went into doing everything from educating individuals in custody of their voting rights, working to register individuals and visiting fa and, and their family members to vote, and training programs and training personnel and program personnel to ensure that the best services were provided. An important element to this effort was executed by the Democracy NYC team that works specifically with the Department of Correction and with cooperation from the New York City Board of Elections to streamline the delivery of absentee ballot applications and then ultimately the absentee ballot applications themselves to individuals in custody. We are currently evaluating this program with our partners and look forward to further broadening our outreach efforts to individuals in custody. We appreciate the Council's focus on making sure that justice-involved individuals have every opportunity to exercise their right to vote. Making our democracy more fair and equitable is a goal that we all share, but can only be achieved when we make sure that everyone has been given the opportunity to engage in their government. I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues in government, from the Department of Correction and Department of Probation. Thank you. Good morning, chairs, and good morning, council members. Deputy Commissioner Michael Tausick. Um, I oversee programs for young adults and adults with the Department of Corrections. Thank you for having me today, and I believe that as we further discuss um, th this, this initiative today, you, you will be quite pleased with the uh, efforts that have been taken by not only the department, but our partners um, across the city as well as uh, volunteers 
in helping us uh, get education and re registration materials out to incarcerated individuals. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Powers, Chair Cabrera, and members of the Criminal Justice and Governmental Operations Committees. I'm Ana Bermudez, Commissioner for the New York City Department of Probation. I want to thank you for your continued interest in the work of the New York City Department of Probation and the ways we can make our city safer, more fair, and equitable. Holding this hearing not only demonstrates that the rights of justice-involved people are import important, but even using the term justice-involved people as opposed to offender, or probationer, or felon indicates whom we're talking about without reducing the individuals solely to the criminal involvement. Using this language preserves people's humanity, and it is absolutely sound practice. Probation is about giving people access to new opportunities and helping them to change their behavior and decision-making patterns as needed. To do that, the people we work with must be able to imagine their lives and futures differently than they do now. That is why, at the start of probation, clients receive a new now folder with information about what to expect during their time with us, our programs and services, and their voting rights and voter registration information. You have samples. I didn't have enough, but you have. Uh, you can share. Um, and I'll, I'll go over more detail um, on that later. Um, what's the importance of ensuring that justice-involved people can vote? You've said it very well in your um, opening remarks. Putting aside that voting is a fundamental right, research shows that the higher level of someone's civic engagement, the less likely they are to commit a crime. The Brennan Center for Justice completed a comprehensive report on this issue in 2009, the findings of which still ring true today. One new voter described his experience as such. When you're afforded the opportunity to vote, you think, I'm fully vested in my city, state, country. I'm just as much a citizen as anyone else. It signals rehabilitation. It presents a mindset that looks forward, not backwards. The report goes on to say, researchers have determined that one's identity as a responsible citizen, including jury service, volunteer work, neighborhood involvement, and voting, is also important. Several researchers have argued that civic reintegration should be included in reentry models because it can help transform one's identity to law-abiding citizen. Restoring the right to vote and removing other bar barriers that result from a criminal conviction also increase public safety. Bringing people into the political process makes them stakeholders, which helps steer them away from future crimes. Branding people as political outsiders by barring them from the polls disrupts reentry into the community. Conversely, Disenfranchisement can actually serve to increase criminal activity as it disconnects people from their communities and denies them one of the most basic methods of having their voices count and affecting change. That is why, as part of my testimony today, I plan to discuss some of the other ways in which the department not only informs people on probation of their rights, but also the work that we have undertaken to help restore any rights lost due to a criminal conviction. Introduced earlier this year, Intro 367 by Council Member Salamanca legislates that during the intake process, the Department of Probation shall distribute a written notice on the voting rights of people on probation, developed with the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee to anyone sentenced to probation. The Department is supportive of this legislation, and it is right in step with our current practice. As I stated earlier, at the beginning of probation, during the intake process, each person receives that new now folder, which includes a voter registration form. If there are any questions about the form or how to fill it out, a member of our team is available to assist. We also keep voter registration forms in, the mul in multiple languages in all of our probation resource hubs across the city. Um, we have about 26 locations, so that's a fairly vast uh, reach. In the first half of this year, we distributed approximately 2,500 forms. We also held registration drives in each borough as part of National Voter Registration Day last Tuesday, September 25th, in partnership with NYC Votes and the, and the uh, Campaign Finance Board. We have some pictures here to show you of folks being involved and, and posters in our, in our waiting areas. Um, and I want to thank the council mem members uh, on both of these committees uh, because you and your staff uh, helped us to spread the word about the event to your constituents. We had over 300 people and their family members attend, and nearly one in three completed and submitted their, submitted their voter registration on site. This helps to ampli amplify that many more voices in advance of this November's multiple elections. 
DOP applauds the state's Executive Order 181, signed earlier this year, which allows for restoration of voting rights for people with felony convictions in New York State. In light of the state policy change, the Council's proposal we are discussing today, introduced by Council Member Cabrera, would amend the New York City Charter in relation to various city agencies assisting eligible people on parole with voter re re registration. DOP is supportive of assisting all New Yorkers with access to voting rights information, including individuals on parole. That said, the city has several operational and legal concerns regarding the accessible public parolee data as it relates to voting rights, as well as challenges interpreting the data by employees who work outside of the criminal justice field. After today's hearing, the administration will coordinate with the agencies listed in the bill to provide more detail on the specific operational concerns. The ability to exercise the right to vote is of paramount importance for anyone to feel fully invested in his or her local community, city, state, and country. Unfortunately, other types of disenfranchisement occur due to justice involvement, such as being barred from holding certain professional licenses or until recently applying for jobs. As part of creating Once New Now, the department and the people we serve work together to try to restore some of these rights and open previously closed possibilities. With support from the Young Men's Initiative, we have collaborated with the Community Service Society and Youth Represent on rap sheet cleanup events to ensure that people on probation have a rap sheet that is accurate and does not needlessly preclude them from opportunities. Our Workforce Development Unit has a great partnership with the New York City Commission on Human Rights to ensure that everyone on probation is aware of the Fair Chance Act, their rights in the workplace and their rights when looking and applying for jobs. This, of course, could not have happened without the leadership of the New York City Council on employment rights for justice-involved people as you pass, as you were, uh, you passed and implemented the Fair Chance Act a few years back. Finally, we regularly file for certificates of relief from disabilities on behalf of eligible people on probation. A certificate of relief is a court document signed by a judge which helps someone with a criminal conviction be able to obtain certain licenses for a job should they want to become a barber or a security guard, for example. We also work with the administ administrative judges of each borough on events at our NEONs, our Neighborhood Opportunity Networks, which are probation community offices, in order to provide people on probation and other community residents with certificates for, of relief. Whether it is correcting one's rap sheet, obtaining a COR, or registering to vote, we want to ensure that everyone's time on probation is focused on accessing and developing their own new now, and thereby strengthening communities and changing lives. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and we'll answer any questions you may have. Just a clarifying question from the Department of Corrections. You, are, you have submitted testimony. You're not reading it on the record? Say again, please. I said you had submitted testimony in writing. Are, are you not giving that testimony? No, I did not have a preamble or an introductory for this to submit. We have, uh, you're the Department of Corrections, correct? Yes, sir. We have submitted, you're Michael Tosic? Yes. Deputy, we, we have a submitted testimony from you? I'm sorry, yes, I thought you were talking about some other documents. Okay, that had. are you planning to read this or? Um, I would just like to submit that for now and then answer questions and related to, uh, I'll field questions. Okay. Calm the thinks we should say thank you to you. Uh, uh, okay. You would. Thank you so much uh, for the testimony. I, since I have uh, the senior advisor from Democracy NYC, welcome. I, I have, as you know, in August 20 uh, of this year, ahead of the 2018 primary election, uh, the mayor announced a raise in poll worker wages from 200 to 250, which I'm sure the poll workers are, are going to be very grateful about that. Based on the testimony at the Board of Election uh, uh, Commissioner's meeting in the past couple of weeks, many poll workers who work on their primary election day were expecting to see a raise in their wages, and they were quite upset, arguably rightfully so that no such raise was reflected in their pay. The Board of Election has stated that no official act was performed by the mayor to initiate the announced pay raise. So I have just three simple questions. One, was an act 
What act has the mayor performed to implement this pay raise? Second, when will, will the announced pay raise go into effect? And last, will poll workers who work for the 2018 primary election receive payback? Uh, thank you for your question, Council Member. Um, first, I, I will say that yes, I am the Senior Advisor for the Democracy NYC Initiative, um, which has to do with civic engagement and, and voter participation and increasing voter registration, uh, which we know is something that we, we can all agree on needs to be better than the city. Um, as far as uh, the Board of Elections, we, we have not had conversations as far as the Democracy NYC initiative. We have not had conversations with them on this. Um, I'm happy to take this question back to uh, the administration and the mayor, but I, I will not speak for, for the mayor in, in this form. I appreciate uh, you getting, uh, going back to the administration because we really do need answers. People deserve the answers, uh, especially if an announcement uh, was made. I'm going to turn it over now to my co-chair, Co-Chair Powers. Thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up question on that? The mayor announced this in August, maybe August 20th or something like that, and, and there's been no follow-up conversation with the BOE after that announcement about increasing the pay? I said as far as the Democracy NYC initiative and our charge, uh, that is not a part of our immediate charge. I have not had conversations with the BOE regarding that matter. Got it. Some, presumably somebody else in the office is handling it and you guys can get back to us with. I, I okay. can certainly. I think also just clarification on whether poll workers will have it for the upcoming election or when that might be received because that was something that people heard poll workers had expressed as a, a concern that they heard the announcement three weeks before. So thank you. And good. Um, uh, just on, before we start, there on both the testimony submitted by the DOC and from the DOP, you mentioned some concerns or clarifying questions around the bills that we're talking about today. Um, I didn't see spe you know, specific comments about what maybe were the changes that you were asking for. Can you articulate what, while well, we have some sponsors here and others, just what those changes might be that you would be asking for in either one of the bills? I'm not sure it's a change, but that we're, there's some concern. It would be out of a dialogue about the concerns in the sense, for the, the a simple one is that in the parallel uh, data, for example, if it could lead to inaccurate, quote unquote, advice that could even be too close to legal advice when somebody may not you know, be uh, interpreting the, the, the information correctly, especially because that data is limited to when the person is still on parole. If the person is off parole, there, there's just a lot of little details that I think it would be good to discuss and work out what, you know, in terms of who's looking at that data, who's advising whom, in what context, just to make sure that people don't get further misinformation, which this is trying to cure, for okay. example. Okay, we'll look for those. Yeah, we'll no, I think the administration is going to do a, a fuller, okay. you know. Thank uh, you. And time. DOC? Thank you, Chair. As for the department, we we're just looking, the department would like to see some clarification in the language that the responsibility for the department would be for incarcerated persons being released, that our responsibility is from a, from a DOC facility and not from court, or if they're transferred to another jurisdiction just due to the logistics involved in the turnover of our population that we, I'm confident and we are confident that we can certainly facilitate our obligation from those being released from uh, one of our, from one of our jails. But from court it becomes just logistically very challenging because we don't know when that'll take place, for instance, in terms of the bail. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks for clarifying. Um, the Department of Probation out outlined and I, promoted and I saw their efforts to help folks get registered. They have a folder here that has, hopefully this is what everybody gets, that has a uh, voter registration form and the flyer for registration. And then also some data points about how many registration forms they gave out, how many families participated in that day. Can the DOC provide us with any information or data on how many, let's say in the last calendar year, people had been received registration forms, how many had registered, any efforts that the DOC has done around voter registration, obviously different agencies with different mandates and populations, but um, any efforts that you have undertaken recently or in the last calendar year and any data points about how effective? 
Uh, yes, Chair. So as you know, this is an ongoing effort. It continues to stay, it will continue into, and I can provide information on what events that we have coming up in terms of registrations and absentee, absentee balloting. But to date, within um, we have had 421 voter registrations and over 300 mail-in ballots. So that's the information that we can confirm up to October 1st. And that doesn't include, so those are, that's, those are data points that stem from our housing units. So that doesn't incorporate our visitor center as well as from our uh, law library areas. So we're still accumulating almost day by day numbers as, as we continue. So that's the numbers that I have for right now. And the 300 for the, who sent the absentee, um, I think it sounded like 300 the, did an absentee ballot. I'm for, sorry, for the mail-in, the mail-in ballots, yes. So the 300. And what for that, for the most recent election or what was that time period for? Um, this reflects over the last, I would say, last 30 to 60 days. So we started our initiative in August. So that represents from August forward. Okay, so that would be only one election in yes. that time period. Yes, sir. Got it. And can you talk, so we were just talking about the process for somebody who is incarcerated in Rikers Island or whether detention facilities today. Um, they receive a, they have to vote by absentee ballot. It's an allowable, as I understand, it's an allowable you know, reason for voting via absentee. They, um, they get it, I think, use their home, I want to just clarify, use their home address and then receive it there. Can you just talk us the steps that are taken to help assist people to figure out how to get an absentee ballot, to re obviously to register? You guys provide them forms, but are there e other efforts as we approach election day to get people registered to, um, to proactively get them registered? to uh, assist us with the absentee ballots and then also to encourage them to vote? Sure, so I'll, DOC. I'll speak first on a my, uh, macro level and kind of distill it down. So I have a sense that some of my response right now will address several questions over the course of this hearing. So um, some of my future responses may be a little bit redundant. So from a, from a macro perspective, it's been uh, really exciting what the collaboration between our set with, between the department volunteers, the mayor's public engagement units, the Legal Aid Society, what we've been able to accomplish since August. So that's, and from a, uh, broader pers from a broad perspective, what that is is infusing a sense of how important it is for incarcerated persons to have that voice to vote. So p part of our training with some of the staff that I'll go over w with the committee has to do with encouraging and educating staff on that. This is not just a uh, mechanized effort. This is more of a uh, altru altruistic effort to, to get our um, incarcerated persons to have a voice that it's important for them and that they can be involved in the civic process. So that, that's the global perspective. So from, from a more distilled, more uh, mechanical perspective, what we've done is four key areas. So we've provided training, which is customarily done to our legal coordinators who, um, who staff up our law libraries. And that makes sense in terms of job role and then also in terms of civic duty and voting. But we've also incorporated um, other correctional counselors and other support staff that can assist not only our volunteers, but continue to educate and encourage our incarcerated persons to vote. We've also done outreach in terms of uh, postering and um, advertising and just providing information through posters throughout all highly trafficked areas in our department. So that includes the intake area, that includes our law library area areas, and that also includes our housing units. And when our initiative started in August, we um, provided over a thousand educational and informational posters to, to our population. The other component of this, which I talked very briefly about, is our in-person outreach as well. And that is our support staff, DOC, DOC staff, working with um, our volunteer base that comes into the, the facility, going unit by unit throughout the department to both register and to educate incarcerated persons on the voting process. And the other piece is the operational piece which is not only going from unit to unit, but getting them in through some of those, those challenges that we have through a, on a day-to-day -day basis. 
So from, from my perspective, when you look at 50, approximately 50,000 are, are taken in, admitted, and approximately 50,000 are released, it's a quite an undertaking to get this uh, message out and to assist incarcerated persons to vote, to be educated on that. And this is a much broader initiative than what was traditionally done in the past, which was using that platform of the law library area to assist our incarcerated persons. Great, thank you. And I know that the Legal Aid Society, NYCLU, and others have been doing efforts uh, to also help register people. In recently, I think it's a newer effort. In the visit area, we're also encouraging and educating those coming through the visitor center to vote as well. Got it, thanks. And the, they, those groups had also raised a concern around uh, uh, there's a time period by which you um, can no longer receive an absentee ballot and, and sign up. So if you are arrested and detained in that window of time between when absentee ballots are, you have to put the, la the last day to receive an absentee ballot, that you would actually be ineligible to vote. And I don't know how many today, maybe you guys can, can look into how many people we're talking about as an affected group, but that um, you can vote, there's no polling place to vote in because you're not, you're, in this case you're not at home, you're not in your, your local polling place, but also you lose the window to actually vote. And I've asked, I think, the Board of Elections to look at whether there would be any mechanism to vote like in person if you are um, in that sort of catchment area. Have you guys taken any look at that? Have you received that request or any sort of information or guidance you can provide to us if what happens to that group that essentially is eligible but disenfranchised from voting because of the a date of arrest? You hit on a very key point. I think it's very d difficult. I don't have a specific response at this time. Um, I think we're all aware of that, of how do we catch how do we catch that group? Um, so the best that we can do is continue our weekly or twice a week um, visits to different housing units and just keep educating. But once we release, once an individual is released, it's difficult. We can't do anything beyond that. So uh, moving forward beyond this, this initiative in terms of um, lessons learned, um, I have an idea to present within the, the several different topic areas in terms of down the road, downstream on that. Okay, thanks. And I think they have put out a request to the Board of Elections to look at like a physical place to, to be able to cast a vote if you miss the opportunity to do it. And we'd ask maybe the administration to help take a look at that and we can forward any correspondence on that. Um, the, uh, in, ahead of this coming election, I know you mentioned some drives around registering to vote. Um, can you give us any information before next week's deadline on the 12th and also as we get to the first week of November, any information on efforts coming up that we can share with folks, but also just efforts that uh, are coming up to help register and encourage people to vote? Uh, general efforts or? Uh, efforts um, specific to the, to, the, to the population we're talking about today. I'm Ooh. just going to read off of some, note, some very recent information that I just got, so I apologize for, for looking at the phone. So, um, I lost it. So as for registration, uh, our next and final registration drives are scheduled for tomorrow. And that's going to take place in one of our jails. And next, next week, we have uh, two jails that will also will, will receive that final drive. As for absentee balloting, uh, the next application completion session will be Thursday uh, for one of our jails and next week for another jail. And this Thursday for two jails. And um, we have another deadline that we're working with another particular jail to uh, work on absentee balloting as well. And in our visitor area, we have voter registration drives since August 11th, three to four days per week with all visitors that are coming into our jails. We just held our, our voter registration drives uh, last week, so up until the deadline, we'll continue to have people you know, fill out the, their, their applications as, as needed as they come into probation. But also we have um, 
closed circuit televisions in all of our uh, reception areas, opportunity hubs. So we will be doing then an encouraging to vote campaign um, that will be at the very least through those TVs and, and I'm sure we'll do other things as well. It's, it's all part of you know, how we want to, to engage people in, um, in their civic duty. Yeah, and there's the and the efforts that were made. Thank you for that. And the efforts that made to register voters uh, recently from the different groups that were doing the few different days of registering voters were those done in was that done in every facility? Yes, sir. It was. Yes, sir. On Rikers included, but what about Manhattan? Fails as well as right. We've been active in every single jail that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna. I want to come back and talk about the governor's executive order. Um, which is, you know, I think sort of rolling out on a basis. But I, before I do that, I want to maybe hand, I'll come back to that, but I want to give an opportunity for colleagues to ask questions. Council, Lan Council Member Lansman. Thank you very much. So I just want to understand, does the Department of Correction have a position on my bill on 514? At this, that's you. Yes, sir. Yeah. At this time, I'm, j um, I'm not going to speak for the department. I would allow the, the department itself to speak regarding the bill, aren't, except that we'd like clarification. I, I just want to clarify. I just want to understand. What's your position? What, what brings you to this table today? I'm sorry, sir. I can't hear what is your What is your title? Who, who? Deputy Commissioner of Programs. For? For the Department of Correction. Okay. Adult programs and young adult programs. And the Department of Correction sent you here to testify about the subject of this hearing? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, so the written testimony, well, maybe you want to take that. Sir? Okay. So, so the written testimony that was submitted from the department, um, you're, you're Michael Tausick, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, this is what you say in, in, in written form. Intro 514, which is being considered by the committees today, would require an additional point of information distribution, as it requires that voting information be provided to everyone upon release from custody. We can certainly provide information again upon discharge, though we would like to clarify some of the text in the bill. Could, could you clarify what you would like to clarify? Yes, sir. So as I, as I spoke to earlier, that in terms of the logistics of the operation of all of our jails, that the department prefers that the, the, the bill be scoped to, make, to keep our obligation to those individuals that are being released from our jail system, in, from a jail. So the way that the release process works is that we have individuals that are released directly from the jails and then some that are released from court. So logistically, it's very difficult to meet that obligation outside the scope of our jail, the jail system. Just for the committee's uh, knowledge. What are the circumstances where somebody who is in DOC custody would be released from the court? Generally, bail conditions are if someone is released outright in terms of whether that would be a judicial decision to release them outright. So there is a process involved in you terms mean, of releasing them. Do you mean at, 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 you're talking about at arraignment? Yes, sir. Okay. Are there other circumstances? That someone could be released. There's a multitude of areas. There can be a pretrial release as well as an arraign, which is the arraignment process. So, someone is delivered to court for their trial or their hearing, and it exactly. goes well for them, and they're going home. They're not going back to Rikers. So, so those kinds of circumstances. That could be. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to work with you on that because we want this to be a workable uh, legislation. Are there any other objections that you can think of other than the the mechanics and the and the logistics of of providing this information? I don't think so. I believe it is that particular logistical challenge. Okay. And with, um, as you'll hear from me in terms of lessons learned and how we can improve upon um, this initiative, it's how we can better educate and inform staff in our intake and release areas through information booklets and as well as other handouts similar to what we're doing right now. And I think we'd be much more successful in that area. Okay. Um, I know there was talk of providing uh, people uh, on their release with a NYC ID card, and, and we might have legislation to that effect. That has its own logistical challenges, in particular people having the, 
the documentation necessary to qualify for, for such a card. Um, would you, can you think of any objection that, that you might have if when we were providing people the information about their voting rights, we also provided them information about how to get an NYC ID card out in the world, where they can go and, and what kind of information they would need to present? I don't believe so. I think that's, that's very doable okay. from within a jail system, correct? Right. Yep. Okay. Yes, Terrific. Um, and, and then my last, um, my last question is for uh, Mr. Fanjo. Um, I know you're not the Board of Elections, but democracy now, you probably speak and deal with the Board of Elections. Um, perhaps you could put in a word with them about changing their website so that it accurately reflects what a parolee's right is to vote. I mean, on the website, it literally says, to register to vote in the city of New York, you must, condition, 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 not be serving a jail sentence or be on parole for a felony conviction. And that's not the case anymore. So maybe if you were to, to communicate with them and maybe if you were to write them a letter and, and, and maybe even CC me, that, that would be terrific. What do you think about that? Uh, I think we can certainly take care of that. All right. Consider it done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask one follow-up question, and I and rarely do we get a consider it done answer. So kudos to you uh, uh, all involved in that. I um, just one question is um, just to follow up on outdated information. Can you tell us the last time the inmate handbook was updated? That does actually have information about voting and access, and I've read it about uh, where to go. But can you tell us if that's been updated any time? In the when the last time it was updated? It's been several years, and we're in the process of updating that right now. And can we expect that there'll be a, a large update to it or it will be just a voting section? I'm not quite sure from some of the security operational pieces, but I know from the program's end, um, there are, there's not substantive changes to it. It's, it's an update on certain, um, certain items. Okay, but and when does that? Nothing big from my end, my shop. And when, when is that, what's the timeline that one expects that to be released? Those that are, are tasked with that uh, duty, ASAP. It, it's, we're behind on it, so we need to get it done. Okay, thank you. I just want to recognize we're being joined by Councilmember Maisel, and I want to turn it over now to Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, um, I, I want to I reframe a little bit. Uh, you know, the chairs did this earlier, but just for purposes of my questions. Uh, Essentially, there are three pieces of legislation here. We're gonna amend the charter, if they pass the council, to require the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, I believe it's now called that, to develop some materials with your two agencies. And then one bill would require corrections to give out this information upon release. The other bill would require probation to give out this information upon intake. Probation, Madam Commissioner, you indicated there's an issue with data. What kind of data issue would give you a concern about simply giving out a flyer developed by another agency, essentially? No, they, we have no issue with the bill related okay. to probation. Okay. It, it's in the bill related to parole. Um, and it's just a, uh, operationalizing it, not, not, a, not conceptually and not in the spirit, not the spirit of it. So there it's anything, not a is there anything that you can't, that, that, that these bills require that you would object to right now? Not in terms of the role that probation plays, no. So if, if the Voter Assistance Commission put out a flyer tomorrow morning advising uh, parolees, uh, probationers, et cetera, on how to, on what their rights are, could they just, I mean, you, you had a concern about providing legal advice, right? No, that wouldn't be about legal advice. The, the issue with the parole information is the operationalizing it in terms of the use of that particular website. I don't know what that so means. In, in the sense, okay, so let's say um, I'm a person with a prior record, like I served time in, um, in prison, and I am, uh, one of the potential dangers here is that I go to a community-based organization to get some services and they start talking to me about, you know, uh, about my ability to vote. And because I served a while ago, right, in the, in the, for a felony, it may say, 
you know, that I can't vote in that, in that registry. But I'm done with probation. I can actually vote. Uh, because, I mean, I'm done with parole. So I can actually vote, even though at the time that I was on parole, I couldn't because of all the changes in the laws that have happened, et cetera. Um, and then there's people who, so th there's just, it's about clarifying, perhaps, and I'm, I don't clarifying know the- in, Clarifying in the, the language in, of the bills? Of the bills, or yes, or any number of potential ways. Wouldn't the solution simply be that the Voter Assistance Advisory Commission simply get the flyer done right, and then you'd have the right information to give out, and it would say somewhere there, you have, you cannot uh, register to vote until such and such date, and then you fill in the blank. Or you cannot register to vote until such time as you fulfill these following conditions, one of which is no longer being on parole. Official I mean, posters or flyers are no problem. I, and I, I can't really cover all the potential well, issues. You, it doesn't mean- If you had mean to change the language in the bill, what, what would you say instead of provide information developed by somebody else? So let, let me just back up a second. This is a concern. The bill lists a lot of agencies that are potentially are affected by this. So the administration's position right now is that we will work with the council to figure out what the potential pitfalls here. I just identified one that would be that has nothing to do with flyers. Has to do with the op the open data on parolees that people can access. That is a public access website. And so, and that contains information about people's uh, uh, ability to vote or not vote. And that is something that is part of the bill. And so, or part of the process. I, honestly, I'm not super familiar with all the details of, um, uh, of it because this is a, this is a f sort of farther reaching issue, not just for probation. But if, if it's the advisory board that comes up with a flyer that has information, that's fine, absolutely fine. Okay. Um, Department of Corrections, Deputy Commissioner. You uh, indicated there was a question about a, clarif a clarification, if you will, about the concept of release from your custody. And uh, Chair Lanceman uh, asked you um, to, to expand on what kind of other releases there are. You referenced court. If somebody's in court and then released by the judge, aren't they then thereafter processed out if they're in your custody? They are. Okay. I just. That, no, that was good. They are. Okay. If they are brought in for arraignment by the police department and then the judge says, ROR, good to go, they're never in your custody actually because the police brought them in and then the judge released them. So it's not referring to those people. It's only referring, I think, uh, and, and the chair will correct me if it's his bill, but it's only referring to those who are in your custody. Uh, is, there, is there any language that you would like to see other than the word, release from the words, release from custody of the department? Because all you're ask, being asked to do again is upon processing out somebody, and this is again referring to corrections, which is different because probation intake corrections on the outside on the, on the uh, exit. You're being asked to give out a flyer that some other fine folks who are represented in this room today uh, would be developing. And you give out the flyer and say, you're now released, here's a flyer on how to uh, resume your right to vote. Of course, if they were not convicted of a felony and they were simply being housed at Rikers for a period of time because they were either being held on bail or they were convicted of a misdemeanor, they would not have forfeited their right to vote. So they would have always had the right to vote. You'd just be giving out a flyer saying, good to go, go vote. Anything in this bill that you need to change in order to be able to do it? Thank you for, th thank you for that question. My role is, and my perspective is from an operational programmatic role of what my division, my command can do on a daily basis to meet a particular bill like this. It's our legal team's role to further look into the detail of the wording to ensure that we can meet that. So that's the conversations that take place within the department, both from an operational perspective as well as from a programmatic perspective. And if it is simply a word or two words, 
that are satisfactory to the, to the department, that my command can fulfill our role, I would say that the department is fine with it. My perspective is, is focused on delivering the best services and programming that we can to incarcerated persons. It's our legal team's role to look on a broader perspective to make sure that the requirements that are set in any bill, any law, are able to be obtainable. So that's, that's my response to that. Okay. The department did not see these bills before you came here today? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, no, just, that's good. Okay. Um, did either of your two agencies, this is, uh, this is uh, my last question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, did either of your two agencies do a cost estimate of what this would cost the city of New York to, uh, it, to do, uh, your agency, either probation or corrections? Did That's either agency, did you, did you look at if there would be a cost involved in, in We already do this, so it's, it's, right. it's within the cost of our an budget. An extra piece of yeah. paper in this yeah. pretty blue folder that, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Our side right now. Similar to the commissioner, it would be, it's already in our budget to, to be able to facilitate this initiative. So, so I, I do not have a specific cost benefit, a, a cost analysis to this, but we're already doing it. We're already promulgating information and receiving information from other agencies, so the cost is not prohibitive at all. One, one more question. The bill's, the bill's written and it's been introduced in the council and our process is <coughs> after a hearing, we would need one more time to vote on it and then it would go to the floor. Let's say tomorrow the fine people at the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee came up with a lovely, pretty blue flyer that fits lovely right into this folder and said, here folks, can you give this out? Would you be willing to give it out to, to the folks who are exiting, uh, who are being uh, intake into the probation system and to the folks who are exiting the correction system? Certainly. Okay, great. All Absolute. right. Perfect. So then when we, they come up here, we can ask them if they could just develop that flyer for you. Okay. Save probably a lot of time. Okay. That'd be great. All right. Thank Absolutely. you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to come back to my original question. Um, you, when I began to uh, ask uh, regarding uh, democracy NYC, uh, and in relationship, the, let me backtrack over here, regarding the poll workers, the increase, the three questions that I gave you. The answer you gave me, if I recall, just remind me, was that originally or still Democracy NYC was not in charge or they didn't have a charge regarding uh, the increase of, of, of uh, the stipend that they get, uh, poll workers get? Did I hear that right? Uh, I, I believe what I uh, said, council member, was that Democracy NYC, as an initiative, the charge um, is aimed at increasing civic engagement for all New Yorkers. Uh, that includes voter participation um, and uh, and voter registration. And so, uh, again, that's yes. So it it was. I'm just trying to get conceptualize this. So, so if I hear you right. It was not part of your charge for Democracy NYC to um, to regarding the increase for poor workers. Is that correct? Uh, it's it's as stated, not a part of um, the Democracy NYC ten point plan, as the mayor stated in. Uh I'm a little and I'm only speaking, sir, about the initiative as it stands. I'm here representing simply the initiative. Yeah, so I'm a little baffled with that because when the mayor announced, as a matter of fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. Democracy NYC, dot, dot, Mayor de Blasio announces extensive inactive voter outreach and, and wage increase for BOE poll workers. And... August 20th, 2018, Brooklyn, as part of the city's Democracy NYC agenda, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that the mayors, and then it goes on. And so it seems to me that, it seems very clear to me that it was part of the, of you guys' charge. I mean, it came from Democracy NYC. 
Well, uh, sir, again, our, our initiative, um, it includes many things. Uh, clearly, I am here representing the voter engagement piece. Um, I can certainly, as I said earlier, get back to you on the other pieces. Uh, they're not under my purview, uh, but any questions that you have to the best of my ability, I will, I will answer on voter engagement or voter registration and civic participation. So for a point of clarification, you are in charge. You, you do have this charge, but in terms of the charge that was given to you, you came to talk about just one particular thing, but the reality is Democracy NYC is, is under their purview when it comes down to uh, the poll workers' increased wages. Uh, again, sir, I, I can certainly take that question back to okay. the appropriate people at the administration. Um, I'm here specifically to speak to uh, voter engagement and participation. Yeah, double Thanks. check that because it's all over the internet. <laughs> it's uh, engraved uh, in the eternal internet wall. Uh, so, any other questions? Uh, Councilmember Powell said yes. The internet is undefeated, my friend. Uh, I, uh, but thank you, we appreciate the follow-up to, to that as well, because we've heard it. Um, I want to talk about the executive order that was signed earlier this year, and I know that it's a state executive order, but um, the executive order um, allowed for, that was signed on April 18th earlier this year from Governor Cuomo to restore the right, right, right to vote for New Yorkers on parole. Um, with the intention to reduce disenfranchisement in the state and to restore justice and fairness to our democratic process by granting voting rights to individuals on parole. Um, the, and as I understand it, this has to go through a process by which the governor actually grant paroles, uh, sorry, uh, pardons those who are on parole to reintroduce re the rights. Do any of the agencies here have any idea of how many individuals, I think 34,000 was the number cited that would be eligible to receive a pardon. Does anybody have, I'm just curious if you have any information on how many, t maybe Democracy uh, NYC knows, um, how many have today have received a pardon? No, I, I don't. Is anybody familiar with the process by which that goes through? Okay, I, it's, a, it's a state thing, I, but I'm, I was just asking, did, have you had any interaction with, anybody here had any interaction with the state as it regards the process or in terms of, um, of granting people the right to, to vote again? I'm sorry, I, no. You have not, no. corrections? As f uh, for our initiative, um, what I can say is that we had that in reach into those uh, parole house, those housing units that have parolees in them, and that's about as that, that's about as much as I can offer from that regarding your question. Okay, and um, and so no into no sort of engagement to date in terms of that process. Whether you should be or shouldn't be, just the question is whether you've had any democracy. NYC, have you guys had any engagement with them on that? Process? Not at the moment. No. Okay, democracy. Can you um, give us more information in terms of your mandate? in terms of, um, in, your mandate is really to help people get engaged in the political process, if part of the mayor's State of the Union, if I remember. Can you tell us what your role will be going forward in terms of in, um, justice involved individuals and their political participation and maybe any either current or anticipated programs that will involve folks who are in any of the agencies here today? Of course. Uh, so, uh, Chair, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, the, uh, the program, the initiative that we've been running actually at Rikers and at the uh, community jails um, actually came from a partnership between Democracy, NYC, and, and DOC that we had been working on since before the summer. Do you have any other kind of upcoming ones or forthcoming that we're, we... We're, we're evaluating that program and looking to see, um, again, what, what other programs we can look to develop in the near future, and we would love any feedback as well. And the voter registration events that are going on, how often do those happen? Like how many times in a year do those occur? I think. For the department, as you'll hear in some, in my uh, lessons learned um, ideas moving forward, is to have a more substantive um, information sharing. Currently, 
and you know throughout the year we have information provided to incarcerated individuals for instance in our law library areas, law library areas but what can we do more this was our first deep dive as a department into uh, initiative like this and so it what came out of it was uh, not only the support from other agencies but and volunteers but there there was a there was a level of buy-in too from the uniform staff, the operational piece of this. So I'm encouraged that we can do more in, in terms of, of that in those downtimes, right, in between elections when in sort of the dull days of summer, so to speak, that we can do more to keep individuals um, educated and, and updated on what's going on. Yeah, I think one of the comments that we had heard was that the um, if you do it right before elections, you miss a whole population that's that's within your custody, other parts of the year, and between elections and things like that. So it sounds like there's an opportunity to do more in the future at different points in time, not just sort of the the end. And we'll look forward to working with you guys on that. I just have uh, one kind of interesting question: Have you ever had uh, a candidate? Uh, come to Rikers? Is there a accessibility for candidates to come uh, meet people in Rikers? And, and also alongside with that, uh, what kind of information is made available uh, to the population Rikers uh, regarding candidates? Do they get mailings? Are they allowed to get mailings? Do you ever see mailings uh, come uh, to Rikers to the population? So am I in my current role, I, I have not experienced a candidate coming through in my previous life. Yes, I have experienced. I think it's very, very helpful. Obviously, there's a tight line that a candidate has to, to uh, walk. But I think it's really super helpful to, to incarcerated persons to put a face with the name. Um, in terms of what we're doing now, uh, we're in communication with the Charter Revision Committee to get candidate information into our law library areas so they do have that information for candidates. But it's an, it's, it is an excellent idea. Uh, follow up to that. Why do you need the Charter Revision Commission to do that? I, and I just I want to note that I actually, in my testimony to the Charter Revision Commission, stressed to them that I thought that the uh, criminal justice system should not be left out of the entirety of the conversation about what the charter could look at, but I'm just curious why that was a charter version. I'm not quite sure, but I can follow up with yeah. you on that. Just be curious. Uh, I mean, you could make a charter, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, the other question I have is there was an issue as, I'm going back to the executive order, but this is maybe a little more operational, so maybe Democracy NYC can answer. There was an issue that, was, that occurred during the primary, I think there was a New York Post article on it, or a New York Daily News article on it, that was about people that were on, that were pardoned, if I'm getting this correct, go not being able to go, not some had, because the polling places are, well, many of them are schools, were not allowed into schools because of a particular offense. And it was obviously something that probably was not anticipated at the time that it happened, and then the realization happened, occurred that schools are prohibited sites for some folks, and also that they're also concurrently poll sites leading that the, I think the, the regulation was to 7 p.m. that people could have to enter the schools to vote, which is 7 p.m. is the end of the day for other reasons. And we have to balance, of course, all these considerations. Have you heard any of those issues? Has the agency looked at them in terms of how to, uh, how to ensure that people have a, an ability to vote without immediately violating again? And, um, and second, any other considerations about how you would deal with that issue. Mr. Chair, and also, uh, also the other agencies as well. I, I can say I, I am not familiar with the issue. I've not read the, the post or the Daily News piece on this, but I will certainly go back and, and certainly do my due diligence and, and review it, and I appreciate the feedback. It's something we can certainly continue talking about. Uh, do you, any feedback? No, sir. Okay. Thanks. And, and I just wanted to go back to the issue on the executive order that my question was asking about earlier in terms of um, the process for it. I think that the information that we, as we understand it, is that it's not just 34,000 or 
they're so eligible. This is happening in some waves, and we're not sure, I think, the date, or what number, or how, or other processes. So it might be an issue we can look at together is the implementation of that, and obviously all involved. Uh, to, 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 if we're going to talk about restoring rights to individuals, I think we should have a process that uh, is we all understand and understand how the, the criteria for it and how, um, and how individuals, you know, get pardoned so they can vote, especially with an upcoming election uh, ahead of us. So we look forward to work with you guys on that as well. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate all the information uh, that was disseminated. I'm looking forward uh, to working with the administration on these bills. And with that, uh, we'll, let's invite Eric uh, Freeman uh, from Campaign Finance Board. Come forward. Everyone could raise their right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Uh, thanks very much. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and Chair Powers, and the members of the committees on governmental operations and criminal justice. My name is Eric Friedman, and I am the Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs at the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Uh, with me is Onita Coward Mayers, and she is Director of Voter Assistance at the CFB. Uh, I thank you for the invitation to provide testimony on the bills under consideration today. The New York City Charter directs the CFB, with the advice and assistance of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee, to increase registration and voting, particularly among underrepresented populations. In a strong, healthy democracy, every eligible citizen should be able to register to vote and cast a ballot with ease. But this is not always the case, especially for those who have been through the criminal justice system. Voting in New York State is nowhere near as easy as it should be. Spending time in a corrections facility should not be an additional barrier to exercising one's right to vote. Our extensive experience registering voters in the field is consistent with that of other organizations that work with this population. Simply put, there's a lot of confusion about voting eligibility for people with criminal convictions. It's crucial that clear and accurate information is available so that everyone, including people with convictions, can exercise their right to vote. When we speak to voters, their friends and their family members in these communities, we often have to ask a series of questions to learn about their status in order to give them useful advice about their eligibility. We believe the three bills under consideration today represent an important step forward for this population because the Department of Probation and the Department of Correction are best positioned to provide individualized advice about a person's eligibility if they have a conviction. As you know, Governor Cuomo signed an executive order in April of this year to pardon individuals on parole, restoring voting rights to 35,000 New York State residents. While this is, a, this is a significant step in the right direction, there's still more work to be done, particularly around voter education. In response to the governor's executive order, we are working with the Center for Law and Social Justice at Medgar Evers College and a coalition of voting rights and criminal justice organizations to inform parolees about their voting rights. We are preparing a clear, easy to follow pamphlet that will ensure uh, that will help anyone convicted of a crime understand their current eligibility status. These efforts supplement the work we do in accordance with Local Law 29 of 2000 to facilitate agency-based voter registration. The CFB provides covered agencies and their frontline staff with training on how to provide voter registration forms in their offices and assist voters in completing them. Both the Departments of Probation and Corrections are covered under Local Law 29, and we've been working with staff in both agencies to implement the requirements of the law. Next Tuesday, for instance, October 9th, we'll be giving a voter registration training to frontline staff at Rikers Island. These trainings are an opportune time to give staff the tools they need to 
to understand and, and explain the complexities in our election system. To support and enhance this work, we need to do everything we can to provide clear and concise information about who is eligible to vote. That's why we're supportive of the legislation before, before you today. Uh, intro number 367, sponsored by Council Member Salamanca, and, and intro 514, sponsored by Council Member Lansman, are simple measures that will ensure the Departments of Probation and Correction help New Yorkers in the criminal justice system effectively navigate our complex state election laws by presenting them with clear information. We're happy to work with these agencies to provide the tools they need to ensure New Yorkers have their right to vote. Their institutional knowledge, along with our guidance, can help New Yorkers who are navigating the criminal justice system to cast a ballot. Intro 1115, sponsored by Councilmember Cabrera, would formalize the distribution of guidance about the voting rights of formerly incarcerated people and included in the CFB's charter mandate to facilitate agency-based registration, a much-needed step to guarantee that all local Law 29 agencies can assist formerly incarcerated New Yorkers uh, in exercising their right to vote. Moving forward, we're happy to continue working with the Council and other local Law 29 agencies to help underrepresented populations have their voices heard. We believe giving these tools to the employees who work directly with New Yorkers in our criminal justice system is the most effective way to get more, uh, more of these people involved in our elections. But it's clear, still clear, that Albany must take action. New Yorkers deserve to have their voting rights restored upon release from prison, which will eliminate confusion about their eligibility. We will continue to, to participate in this important conversation, and we look forward uh, to working with you to make sure all New Yorkers have a voice in our democracy. Uh, again, we thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, um, and thank you for your part discussing your efforts to help make the uh, executive order more successful by helping to, to um, uh, provide information to people about what their rights are. Okay, was that a result of any particular directive, or what, what was the impetus for the CFB and the VAAC to, to do that? Well, I mean, really it comes from, you know, our experience, um, you know, not just working directly with agencies uh, to implement uh, local, t local Law 29 and the charter mandate to, to help facilitate agency-based voter registration, but also just um, kind of voter registration out in the field. Um, you know, working with members of the public who, who would come and kind of ask questions uh, during our, our kind of public-facing voter registration drives. Um, you know, it just, it, 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 again, you know, to kind of refer back to the testimony, uh, it becomes clear that we are kind of, you know, there's a, there's a kind of 20 questions game that goes on if, if people are, are, are unsure about their rights uh, and unsure of their status. Um, so w it became clear to us um, that more tailored information was needed. You know, we're always looking to kind of expand the resources and make sure that um, those populations that are underrepresented among voters, um, you know, have the information they need to participate. And so whether that is, you know, working with the Department of Homeless to kind of talk to um, registered voters in the shelters or providing more tailored uh, information resources to particular populations, um, that's something we're always looking to do. Uh, and so um, providing resources for um, individuals who are working their way through the criminal justice system is, is just a natural outgrowth of those efforts. Thanks. And have you seen the issue I talked about earlier where it, um, I think they're potentially misleading that everybody is today pardoned. They actually still have to go through a process to be individually receive, again, their rights to vote. And they're not pardoned. In fact, they're pardoned for their right to vote. Some miscommunication. Have you experienced any particular individuals or groups exp under, like, being confused with what is the uh, implementation and timeline? I mean, I don't know that I have a specific story to tell. I, I can say that um, the way that the executive order, uh, the executive order is a, is a great step in the right direction. I'll read agreed, it. Agreed. Um, you know, the way it is constructed, it, it, it does not allow, allow us or anyone to provide a kind of blanket statement. So, you know, you, you know, by virtue of X, you are eligible. Um, you know, there, there, there is a list of, of, of people who, who, who the governor's office will review every month to see if, if their voting rights will be restored. And there is, as, you know, as, as was mentioned in an earlier round of testimony, a public lookup tool um, uh, that, that, that potential voters need to check to see if they're eligible. 
Um, so that, and I think that does um, potentially lead to, to some confusion. And I think, again, um, providing inputs along the way where, um, where people will have this information presented to them um, is gonna be helpful to ensuring that um, the effects of that executive order reach who it's intended to reach. And I'm sorry, did you say that you are recommending that there should be a tool where people can look up? Uh, I'm referring to the, to, the, to the state lookup tool that exists, right? It's referenced, uh, you know, um, in the earlier round testimony. Is, I, think, I think you've referenced it in the committee report uh, as well. Got it. And do you, um, do you know today, just curious from your experience so far, um, uh, how one receives notification of whether they are now eligible to vote because of uh, the executive order? My understanding is that individuals don't receive uh, notification, is that, that, you know, that your only notification is go to this website and look to see if your rights have been restored. Or, or, or the Department of Probation. So under that scenario, you in fact could be eligible to register to vote and miss the opportunity to do it in time for the election because there was no notification given about your voting being restored. Correct, correct. So, so the guidance that we're preparing includes um, you know, a direction to, you know, here, here's where you go to look to check your status. Um, the additional step that is proposed in the legislation I think is a good one. Um, uh, it, it is another opportunity for individuals who may not have certainty about their rights to have those rights explained to them. Okay, you, so we would appreciate any efforts that um, we can help with as well as this with to actually inform people because if you are votes or voting rights are restored and you have no idea and miss an opportunity to register and vote, it, it, it doesn't seem to be serving the purpose. So to the degree that we can be as, assist with that, we would be, I think, happy to do so. Um, can I ask you just a jurisdictional question? We had Democracy NYC here. You, you do, seems like your mandates are sort of converge on each other. Where is the split between what you do and what they do, and particularly around this set of issues? Well, we, you know, we have our mandates under the Charter um, to encourage voting and voter registration by all New Yorkers, uh, with particular focus on New Yorkers who are underrepresented among those who vote and are registered. Um, so, you know, certainly, you know, the, the, the administration through Democracy NYC is, um, is interested in and committed to the same work, and we've had opportunities to work together on these issues, and um, I anticipate th those opportunities will continue into the future. So it's, I, mean, I think we've enjoyed a, a good kind of collegial working relationship, um, uh, and, and there, there are, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't know if you have one. Is there, is there an area where we would, ask the CFB or the VAC to do something around this population that we would ask differently of Democracy NYC? I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, I will say, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that CFB and Voter Assistance Advisory Committee brings to this work um, that we feel is important, um, we, are, uh, we are an independent agency, uh, we are nonpartisan, and, and those, those two things are, um, are the base of everything we do, and they inform the way that we go about this work um, in a way that, and this is not, you know, any comment on what's happening in Democracy NYC. It's just that that is the way that we that we approach the work, um, and and it ensures that um, it will continue um, despite you know despite whoever the next administration is you know, that comes in and w whatever their commitment is to this work, we're going to continue doing what we're doing. Thank you. Thanks. And the um, efforts to increase to ensure that um, other populations are considered in these and the justice in, uh, involved population is, in, is part of the events that you do. Have you have you done in the past events with groups like the Fortune Society or other groups that are dealing whose prime mission is to deal with uh, formerly incarcerated or current incarcerated populations? We've certainly had some of those partnerships. I don't know, Anita, if you want to talk about specifically. Um, Good afternoon. So also, my name is Onita coward Mayers, Director of Voter Assistance. So as part of the collaboration with Medgar Evers, uh, we're working with the Center for Law and Justice, so for Social Justice, Focal New York, Catal, Common Cause, Legal Action Center, Brooklyn Defender Services, Brennan Center, and 
NYCLU, New York Civic Engagement Table, uh, and also there was a postcard that we worked with legal services with um, to, uh, to address a lot of these questions as well. So we have been, and we've gone into Rikers, onto Rikers Island and done voter registration directly as well, working with the Bronx Defenders. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. And, and the, um, is, is your staff properly trained to help under, to look to help determine if under current eligibility whether somebody is eligible or not? That's correct. Yes. Uh, and, 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 you know, our staff gets that training and what, you know, what the questions are to ask and that, you know, that knowledge is being kind of put into the materials that we're preparing. Got it. Thanks. And are there recommendations that you have for the council administration and other agencies that are here in terms of how to better increase numbers of registration, political participation, voter involvement, um, beyond the bills that are here today? Are there other recommendations that I read the CFP recommendations often? I wonder if you have any particular <laughs> to, uh, to this um, particular issue. Well, you know, you know, every year we publish a voter assistance report that, that has, I think, a, a, I, I would I would recommend that as if, if you're if you're into CFP reports, um, um, as a uh, which contains every every year a series of recommendations, administrative and, and legislative, uh, that would that would increase voter participation and voter engagement. A lot of those, frankly, are aimed at Albany, right? Because that's where. Um, um, you know, we, uh, a theme that we return to often uh, is that, you know, really where real change needs to be made to increase voter participation across the board is with state election laws. Um, you know, you know ev even though we've had this uh, very recent increase in turnout, New York still regularly, uh, in, in last month's primary election, New York regularly ranks near the bottom in the, of the nation in terms of uh, voter turnout and voter engagement. and. Uh, in order to do, to do make lasting change to that, um, we're going to need to change the way that the state runs elections. Great, thanks. And just one more question before I, I hand it back over. Um, have I should I'm sorry, I should ask this to the other population, the other groups as well. But have you received any notice, just anecdotally, not that you'd receive it directly, of anybody being rejected for being able to register who was in the population that should have been pardoned? Um, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. I don't have those facts on hand, but can, can report back. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Go ahead. Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, too, uh, enjoy a collegial working relationship with the CFB, as you know. Uh, I, I just had a quick question. Oh, I meant that for real. Um, I also read your reports. Uh, you indicated that the, that the CFP voter assistance uh, advisory, whatever that's now called, advisory committee? Advisory committee. Okay. We used to call it the voter assistance commission. That's correct. It's a better name, shorter, use less ink. Uh, you said that you support those two, the two bills, uh, 367, 514, and they're simple measures. I agree, and I think you saw that from my questions earlier to the commissioner, the deputy commissioner. Um, and you indicate that you're happy to work with the departments to provide the tools they need to ensure New Yorkers have their rights to vote. I asked them, and I'm sure you heard, and I, I don't mean to oversimplify it, and I, I, perhaps I am oversimplifying it, but I described what the, the, the result of the bill, if it were to be enacted, as a flyer that they give out. And, and do you envision something more than that? Is, is there a technological piece? Is, is there a research tool? Is there some kind of access to a database that they need to have that you can facilitate? Or is it simply just, you know, your very smart lawyers help design a flyer in consultation with their very smart lawyers, come up with something, should take a day or two, and, you know, then it's there. Well, I will say it will probably take more than a day or two, but I agree with your characterization. I, I agree with your characterization of the bill as drafted, right? It requires that we provide materials uh, to those, those departments and that they will incorporate them into the work that they do. Um, I, I, I will add that um, that many agencies, including the ones we're talking about, you know, regularly look to go above and beyond the mandates that, that, that I spoke of in Local Law 29. Um, you know, we have seen across all agencies that uh, um, that we've worked with 
a, a deep commitment to voter engagement and voter outreach, and many of them look to incorporate voter registration and, and voter engagement into their work in other ways. Um, you know, so, so th those resources are, you know, we, we regularly work with agencies to do that, and there are additional resources available uh, to agencies who wish uh, to go above and beyond their mandates, but I think we agree on, on the read of what is in the legislation, which is that we'll provide um, the materials that uh, the departments will work into their workflows. So, uh, and, and I, I, I don't mean to, again, I don't, I, I don't mean to oversimplify this at all, but one of the uh, uh, pieces of legislation that were introduced was an amendment to the charter to uh, give you more of a mandate in working with these two agencies to help this particular population. And obviously it hasn't been enacted yet, but uh, without it being enacted, can you just simply pr uh, provide this information to the agency and say, you know, here's a draft flyer of what we think, if you gave it out to your target population, it would be very helpful and it would meet the intent of what the council is trying to accomplish here? Yes. Okay. That seems simple. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, let me call for the next panel, Sean Morales-Doyle from the Bremen Center for Justice at NYU School of Law, Vidal Guzman from, from Just Leadership USA, Isabel Said Moskin, National Action Network, and Rachel Bloom from Citizens Union. You can begin as soon as you're ready. I guess I'll begin. Um, good afternoon, Chairpersons Cabrera and Powers. Uh, my name is Sean and the members of, of both of the committees. Uh, my name is Sean Morales. Louder? Sure. Yeah, just get the mic closer to you. Yeah, that, I can use my, my courtroom voice and be there a little bit better. Um, my name is Sean Morales Doyle. I'm a counsel on the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. Um, and I would like to thank the committees for holding this joint hearing and um, inviting public testimony about these uh, three introductions. Um, the Brennan Center uh, is a nonpartisan law and public policy institute based in New York City. Uh, we seek to improve our systems of democracy and justice. Uh, and we work on a range of voting rights is elections issues, um, but included among those is the, um, the issue of restoring voting rights to people who have been, uh, who have convictions in their past. Uh, we've spent a long time working on this issue in New York in particular and across the country. Um, and we've advocated for both legislative and executive uh, action to restore rights to Americans living in New York's community with convictions in their past. Um, we were, of course, pleased when Governor Cuomo announced that he would begin using his pardon power to restore voting rights uh, to people on parole. And I, I have submitted written testimony, but I also want to say that I think a couple of the questions that have come up so far today about how that process works, I'm happy to address, and that's not necessarily um, included here. And I, and I know some of the other folks up here can do that as well. Um, we continue to advocate for the state legislature to pass a, a legislation to codify and improve upon the governor's action because as when we get into that, it will become clear there are still some um, concerns about the way that that functions um, and, and some limitations on what the governor can do as opposed to the legislature. Uh, and we'd encourage the city council to express their support for that sort of legislation in, in the state legislature. Um, but whether or not the state legislature acts as has become clear today, there's uh, much work to be done to ensure that the legal restoration of voting rights um, actually leads to registration and voting by impacted New Yorkers. Um, and, and we think that these three bills would do a lot towards um, moving that, towards that goal. Um, as you know, the, the, the law in New York only disenfranchises people while they, if they have a felony conviction in their past while they are in prison or during their time on parole. Um, but as we've all talked about today, there's a lot of confusion about who that actually impacts. And, um, and that leads to people being what we refer, having what we refer to as de facto disenfranchisement. That is, they, they think they can't vote, and so then they don't get registered and they don't vote. Um, in New York is, is behind 16 other states and D.C. Um, because its law works this way. So there are 16 states and Washington, D.C. where you get your right to vote back as soon as you return to your community. Um, that we're closer to that now that Governor Cuomo has begun using um, the pardon power. And um, 
And New York is also only one of a handful of states that allows people on probation to vote but not people on parole to vote, which leads to all this confusion that we're talking about and is sort of a bizarre distinction that your typical New Yorker just doesn't understand. Um, and, and many lawyers don't understand. So um, we, we want to, I want to talk a little bit about this process. I'm going to depart a little bit from my written testimony here. The way that this works is that the executive order only required that the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision forward the governor a list every month of the people who are currently on parole, and then he runs through that list, or his staff runs through that list, and decides whether or not to grant pardons to all of those folks. The governor's um, expressed position is that anybody who is successfully living in parole, uh, living in the community and successfully completing the terms of their parole will have um, their pardon granted, a pardon will be issued. Um, the initial pardon in May was for just over 24,000 people. Um, and that is less than the total number of people living on parole um, for a number of reasons. If someone returns to custody um, or if somebody is not currently successfully completing terms of parole, regular meeting with parole officers, there are people who are technically on New York parole who are out of state. There's a variety of reasons, but the vast majority of people on parole were pardoned in May, and then there's been a monthly uh, recurring review of the list of people who go on to parole. The last number I saw was actually in a Wall Street Journal article yesterday from the governor's office was 30,666 people that have been pardoned thus far. Um, and the, the way that people are provided the information as to whether or not they've been pardoned sort of happens in two ways. One is that at the next meeting with their parole officer, their parole officer is supposed to hand them a copy of their pardon certificate um, and a voter registration form. Uh, and at least anecdotally from people who I've talked to who are on parole, that has been happening in, in the interaction with the parole officer, um, at least that those papers are being handed over. The second way, which has been referenced a couple times, is that um, DOCS has a website called the Parolee Lookup. It's maybe not the best name for the website, but they have added a field to that website since the governor began doing this that indicates whether somebody on parole has had their voting pardon issued. So you can look up anybody by their name or their DOCS ID number, and it will tell you whether or not they've had the voting pardon issued. That, I think, is what in, in introduction 1115 is being referenced when VAC is supposed to be providing information through the agencies about how people can find out. It is a, is a reference to that website. And I think the concerns that were referenced earlier by the Department of Probation are that sometimes there can be confusion as to what exactly that website is telling people, and they don't want to be misleading people. And at least the way that I've heard that confusion come up so far, and I think there are people at this table that have done more of the actual registration work than that can t speak to this better than me, but the, the, if you look somebody up, it says what their status on parole is, and then there's a field that says voting pardon issued, and it either says yes or no. But if you're no longer on parole, it will say voting pardon issued no, because you don't need a voting pardon to be issued. It will also d indicate that you are no longer on parole, but when people are just looking for that one field, it sometimes misleads them, and they can tell somebody who has already completed their parole that they don't have the right to vote, and that's problematic. So we would want whatever guidance is being given to be very clear about that point. The first thing that someone should check is whether this person is actually still on parole or not. Um, and uh, a couple other quick points. So, so I would say that we think it's really important because of all this confusion that this happened at people on probation, people who are um, within DOC's custody, um, and generally that all the people, all the agencies that are involved in voter registration are aware of how this process works. So these three bills do provide for all three of those things. Um, but a couple small changes that we would suggest, one would be adding to the written notice that's being provided here by um, also providing for verbal notice, just because when people are interacting with the government in any type of in instance, when you just get a piece of paper handed to you, sometimes that's not enough, and some actual human interaction can really um, draw someone's attention to what all these papers mean. That's a small thing. Um, and then the second is the um, introduction 514 requires uh, DOC to provide voter registration form to people upon their release, but the vast majority of people in DOC custody can register while they're in DOC custody and in fact have a constitutional right to vote while they're in DOC custody. So uh, it, it's not clear why we shouldn't be doing it at some point earlier, not just upon release. Why not at the earliest point practicable 
when they're in DOC custody. And the current charter provides for DOC, along with every other um, participating agency, to provide voter registration forms to people. But the way that the charter is written, um, the way Section 1057A is written, you provide that voter registration form whenever someone is um, applying for services from the relevant agency. And I think my best guess is that people who are interacting with the Department of Corrections are never in the position of applying for services from the Department of Corrections. That's not really the way that works. So I don't know that the way 1057A is worded currently actually requires the Department of Correction to provide a voter registration form at any point. Um, and so we think rather than just saying at, upon release, it should be at some point earlier in, in custody. Um, with those recommendations in mind, I, I want to sum up, I don't want to take up too much time, with a, a few points about the importance of these bills from our perspective and about the importance of doing this kind of work. The first is that I want to highlight, as I'm sure everyone is aware, but I just want to highlight this, that this is a racial justice issue um, in New York and across the country. Uh, you know, three quarters of people living on parole in New York are African American or Latino. This is felt, being felt disproportionately by people um, of color. And, and that's not actually an accident. The reason New York's law is the way it is dates back to a change to the Constitution that um, accompanied, and basically was an attempt by New York to avoid the mandate of the 15th Amendment to provide the right to vote to black men. Um, and so th this is the intended situation um, that, that the people who wrote New York's law wanted to, to take place. Um, second, uh, Encouraging voting among justice-involved individuals is a, is a smart approach to criminal justice. There was a reference made in earlier testimony to a report from the Brennan Center on this issue, but um, the American Probation and Parole Association, the Association for Paroling Authorities International, um, all, all these professional organizations all agree that um, people who are living in the community should have the right to vote. It, it just makes sense. There's no better way for someone to reintegrate into their community and demonstrate a commitment to society at large than to vote, so we should be encouraging that sort of behavior. Um, and finally, we, uh, we will only see the true benefits of this restoration of voting rights um, if through concerted efforts to inform and register voters. And I think some of the other people up here will, uh, will talk about voter registration drive efforts that have been going on since the, the governor began um, issuing these pardons targeted at people on parole. We are very happy that there are people doing that work. We've been tracking that work. Um, and, and I'll say that based on our research, since the pardon was issued, a thousand people have registered to vote that have received a pardon. And obviously out of the 30,000 that have received the pardon, that's a relatively small number, but that's in a matter of only a, about four months. So this began in May and we think about a thousand people have already been registered. That's thanks to these people doing the, the hard work of of um, getting people registered and we really urge the city to join them in that work and that's why we think it's really important that these um, bills be approved and, and sent to the floor for a vote. Um, thank you again for your time and consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions about the process, about the way this website works, any of, any of that sort of thing. Thank you. Max. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Isabel Zeitz Moskin, and I am a national organizer at the National Action Network, a national civil rights organization founded by Reverend Al Sharpton in the spirit and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, I thank the committees and chairs Cabrera and Powers for these joint hearings to address an issue that is extremely important both to Nan and. Do you mind putting the mic? Yeah, closer? Right, there you go. Thank you. So okay, uh, to Nan and to me personally. Um, I come forward speaking from years of experience doing voter registration in multiple states, some where there, people on parole and probation have the right to vote, and then coming to New York, um, where, as Sean mentioned, only people on uh, probation have the right to vote. Um, and I think, so what is a fundamental right for all citizens of America has become a subject of guilt and anger among populations in New York who already have been left to feel forgotten and voiceless. I've spent many hours uh, registering voters both at parole offices in New York City and on Rikers Island and have been consistently greeted uh, with skepticism. People still don't believe that they have their right to vote as a justice-involved individual. And it is no wonder that they have this skepticism with the amount of misinformation originating in the state itself. 
um, Board of Elections websites, Board of Elections workers, physical voter registration forms, posters in the dorms of Rikers Island are just some in the long list of government created and sponsored resources that provide incorrect information to voters on this issue. Um, it is imperative that we immediately repair the system of de facto disenfranchisement due to misinformation. I applaud the introductions put forth by council members Salamanca, Lansman, and Cabrera to do so, but I also want to ensure that in notifying justice involved people, the bills do more than just a written notification system. Organizations like our, my own have been doing much more than written notification and parole officers have been directed to physically track down their parolees to inform them of their rights to vote. I attended a state senate joint committee hearing this past Monday where the council leader of division 236 of the public employees federation um, who oversees parole officers uh, described the overbearing task of tracking down the people they supervise to notify them. People on parole are already receiving stacks of paper from their parole officers at, after each meeting. Um, a voting registration form just becomes another paper among an already overwhelming stack, especially for people who are just being released. Most people I talk to say they don't know about their right to vote, and then when I show them the registration form, they're reminded of this piece of paper that their PO gave them, but they didn't realize exactly what it was or what it meant. And others say they never received the piece of paper. But as Sean mentioned, there is a directive from the governor's office that every parole officer must give their parolees this physical piece of paper. Um, clearly, there has been inadequate explanation or some gaps in the process of disseminating this information. Additionally, there have been issues with the actual Board of Election workers telling people they must hand in their physical pardon with the registration form, which is something I personally experienced at the New York County Board of Elections, which I then contacted the legal department of the citywide Board of Elections, and they told me that's not their policy, but it happened to me and other people that I spoke to multiple times. Um, so these hurdles help to explain the low number of people, the thousand number of people that um, Sean mentioned who are currently registered um, of the 30,676 was the number I got um, of people pardoned so far, which doesn't account for 646 pardons that have so far been revoked. All of which point to misinformation and miseducation and not a lack of interest on the part of justice involved people. I hope that these bills can also adequately provide trainings to the many agencies that are on the list of participating voter registration agencies, as it is, as it is clear that these agencies are not currently actively encouraging registration based on earlier testimony where a lot of people didn't even realize what was going on in the Department of Corrections where I've been going on weekly voter registration drives with um, Legal Aid Society and a few other groups. Um, and I also want to emphasize the importance of having trusted and patient staff available to assist at these agencies and also offer education and provide more information just besides an actual voter registration form, but information on candidates as you asked about before, um, and also highlighting having more of a presence in places like parole offices and homeless shelters. Um, I ask the committees to consult organizations like my own and Vocal New York and other groups that have been um, legal aid who have been doing the process of registering people who are justice involved. Um, the systematized disenfranchisement is certainly not restricted to just people on parole, rather it is all justice involved individuals. Many people including Board of Elections workers and legislators do not know the difference between parole and probation and do not take the time to learn the difference. This has been a major source of misinformation. There are 36,000 people on parole roughly, over 16,000 of whom are in New York City with an additional 19,000 people on probation, all of whom become wrapped up in the narrative that justice involves citizens cannot vote. That is why I also ask the council to consider supporting and advocating for the state legislation to automatically restore voting rights to people on parole upon release. We must 
help to end the mass spread of misinformation and act as a model for the rest of the nation. Um, I've also submitted in my written testimony the text of this legislation as well as an article that was written by the appeal um, chronicling the rampant misinformation within Board of Elections, public materials on their websites, etc. cetera. Um, thank you for listening. Hey, how you doing? My name is Vidal Guzman. I'm the community organizer for Just Leadership USA um, that's leading the Close Rikers Island campaign. Um, I think it's most important as a person that's on parole who actually registered uh, to vote um, is that the process as a person that's coming in, uh, actually going to parole, is that parole is just giving you your paper. Um, they're not educating you like, hey, you can vote. Um, this is how you vote. There's a lot of people as a community organizer when I do outreach and I speak to the people in the community is that they don't know how to vote. You know, people think that people, if you put something in front of them, it's like, oh, I could vote. They, some people don't know the process. We need, we need to also understand, like, people in parole are not doing a great job at all educating people about how do you vote, why is it important to vote, and who is exactly represent their communities. Um, so this is another thing we should be asking council members, and I'm going to ask council members, a lot of y'all send a lot of mail to y'all community that serve. You actually need to send out these papers telling them people that are on parole can now vote. That definitely, that's a proper education and pieces that everyone get mail. If you're serving communities that are people who are dealing with the criminal justice system, you should be sending paperwork saying, hey, you can now vote. This is where you need to go if you have questions. Um, this is what you need to know uh, why you need to vote. Um, I think, you know, we, we also have to educate people. There's a lot of people, a thousand people. That What that means is that, you know, basically while we only got a thousand people that's voting, uh, that's on parole is the problem is it's like we're not educating people you know we're not going out in these communities that we're serving in these communities that we actually believe in and actually educating them. people don't believe you telling them they want to see that paperwork they want to see that paper and then when they do have that paper they want to be educated on that part let's take ourselves and know why we do this work is to get people who has not had the opportunity or never seen people vote in their life how to vote you know there are communities that never voted ever in their life or have parents that never voted in their life. So they're dealing with the same process. It's like, what, what, why do I have to vote if my moms or my grandfather never voted? You know what I'm saying? So it's, we've got to really go to the groundwork as the community organizer that's doing the work in the community is educating people. So I'm asking not just these bills being passed, but making sure that we're doing the groundwork and sending these letters out that we send out to our communities. Because I get them from a lot of people. You know, I get them from, you know, my council members, Bill Perkins. You know, we want to see more of that educational part. Uh, when they're sending all the work that y'all doing, all the amazing work that y'all want to do, y'all doing in the community or whatever y'all doing, we want to get them papers and saying, hey, people on parole, y'all now can vote. These are things that help us out in a bigger way because we know that there's so many different organizations, but y'all are the, the community that y'all serving. And that's all I really have. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Cabrera, Chair Powers, and members of the City Council. My name is Rachel Bloom, and I'm the Director of Public Policy and Programs at Citizens Union. Um, Nonpartisan and independent, we seek to build a political system that is fair and open, values each voice, and engages every voter. Um, we organize New Yorkers to strengthen our democracy and improve our city, and thank you for having us here today. So I'm also going to stray from my written testimony because I think that's more interesting. Um, I, so I used to historically work on campaigns nationwide to do voter, uh, to work on campaigns to change state laws to um, enfranchise more people in the criminal justice system. And I have done surveys of election administrators in states across the country and in fact co-authored the report published by the Brennan Center and the ACLU called de facto disenfranchisement, which analyzed um, state surveys all over the country, asking questions of all county election administrators, you know, what is the rule if I have a felony conviction? 
Can I vote if I'm on parole? Can I vote if I'm probation? Can I vote if I have an out-of-state felony conviction? Um, and what I can tell you is that universally across all states in the country, there is confusion. There is especially confusion around things like the difference between probation and parole. That is a very technical criminal justice term, and I bet there are people in this room that do not know the difference between probation and parole. Um, and election administrators in particular, you know, they are election administrators. They are not criminal justice advocates. Advocates, and we ask them to serve as such. And so it's a very complicated, um, it's a very complicated position we put them in. Um, the Brennan Center has done surveys not so recently, but historically in New York that show there is confusion and that people, election administrators, including in New York City, are distributing incorrect information. They're confusing probation and parole. Now, we obviously very much um, support and uh, congratulate Governor Cuomo for issuing Executive Order 181, um, and we think it's a wonderful move, although one that needs to be codified by law, because as we have seen in states across the country, what you do through Executive Order, you can roll back. Um, but, and we do see this not just as a voting rights issue, but as a racial justice issue, a criminal justice issue, um, because it has a far greater impact on black and Latino communities um, across the state and in New York City. But for Executive Order 181 to really have power, there needs to be an education campaign behind it. And honestly, we can't rely on things like the New York City Board of Elections, for instance, to do that. Um, Last night when I was thinking about what I was going to say today, I went to the New York City Board of Elections website and it states that in order to be eligible to register to vote, you quote, must not be in prison or on parole for a felony conviction. There's no additional information that explains that you can, you know, you have your executive, you can check and most likely you have had your rights restored. That doesn't exist on the City Board of Elections website. Also, the voter registration form that you click on to download on the New York City Board of Election website says, along with a host of other requirements, that you, quote, not be in prison or on parole for a felony conviction. So imagine you're coming out of the system or you're coming out of incarceration. You want to make sure you're not going to be violating your parole. You go to the website of the people who administer this law, and they don't have information that explains it to you. So. That is sort of a perfect glaring example of why it's incredibly important that when the New York City Board of Elections and the State Board of Elections also has confusing information, that we are doing the steps that we can within the five boroughs to make sure that people have the correct and accurate information. Um, you know, there's this thing that once someone's been told they can't register to vote, they think they never can, people don't want to get in trouble, they don't ever want to do anything, you know, um, that's going to possibly, you know, violate their probation, vi uh, violate their parole. <laughs> and see, here I'm getting confused myself, and I do know these things. Um, so we need to have these, these touches across the different parts of the criminal justice system um, that are encouraging people, that are telling them verbally, um, aside from the fact that you get a lot of paperwork when you're exiting, um, whether incarceration or probation, parole. Also, a lot of people that we're talking about have very low levels of reading comprehension. If you look at the voter registration form, the print is really tiny. They're obviously not clear, as we have discussed today. And a lot of things are written in a very legalistic sense, that if you don't have a law degree and you're a little confused, you're just going to stay on, um, you're going to try and make sure that you, rather than possibly err, you're just not going to, you're just not going to register. So um, we, I encourage you to follow the recommendation, the recommended um, amendments that were suggested here today. Um, and just, I commend you on this legislation because it's, in it's, a, it's, it's a great step that happened at the state level, but there's so much confusion. And if you've ever done a voter registration drive, you will hear people say to you over and over and over, and I've done this throughout the country, and I've done it in New York City, um, I can't register to vote, I'm, I was locked up. And they just think that automatically means you can never register to vote. Um, and so we need people, not just me on the street, they're like, I don't know you, are you telling me the truth? Am I really going to get maybe in trouble? But we need trusted institutions where they think, okay, yes, this is my parole officer. This is like the person who's giving, you know, it's my probation officer. This is this person who's helping me, you know, access X, Y, or Z. These are trusted people um, who are within this system. 
that they can really look to. So um, thank you, and uh, that's it. So thank you so much. Uh, we are uh, definitely, as a matter of fact, Council Member Lansman uh, earlier uh, today made the point at, of the error at the Board of Elections website, and we will surely follow up with that. Uh, Mr. Guzman, you made an interesting proposition. The idea here is for elected officials to uh, send a mailer. The question I will have for you is how do we, as elected official, will have the information and who to actually do a mailing to that are in parole or in probation? How do we Yeah, I think that's, I, I think, a community always speaks, right? Um, you know, I think it's important for council members to send it out to whoever they serve, right? Um, I think what it should have is talking points about who, seeing, figuring out who they could call if they could vote, figuring out, you know, that telling them why they could vote, why is it important for them for vo to vote. But it's up to y'all to figure out what community I actually serve to send it out to everyone. I feel like that is important to just send it out to the community you serve. Um, if it's around 300 people, open that budget up. Send that send that mail list to these people. You know, yeah. It's, it's so the the thing is, we don't we don't have a list that says, okay, this person is in probation and parole. No, I'm not I, saying I'm not saying that I'm not. But saying you're talking like overall. That. I'm talking about overall. So the board of elections, yeah. you know, they they send out information. What I'll be looking for for the Board of Election is to have language clarifying everything that we have been, spoken, uh, been speaking about today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they're responsible in sending our information to make sure that people are updated and, and hopefully in a language that people but, can understand. Yeah, but th a lot of the things you're saying is about uh, websites, websites, you know what I'm saying? There's no, no, a mailer, yeah, they do. Yeah, they, they, yeah. yeah. yeah so if we're making that happen and, and the community is getting that info, um, that would be amazing. You know, we just gotta make sure, we are not gonna know who's gonna be on parole and probation, um, but it's important that every community should know that voting, people on parole can vote, even if their household don't have no one who's on parole and probation. Um, they probably know someone or they know a family that's on parole and probation. So it's just a word of mouth and just the, the plane to help us out as organizations that's doing the groundwork to help us out in that way of educating people about voting. And that's what I was gonna say next, what, what y'all do doing plus the other organizations we're going to hear next uh, is crucial and even uh, the cure of violence uh, groups and uh, credible messengers and everybody who's in the streets and, and working in our communities I think they're they're you know those are the frontline people that really uh, are credible who are they they are going to believe and and they have the best interests uh, of the people and so you were going to say something yeah, I was just going to add that um, we have been doing some targeted outreach to people on parole. It's not necessarily the best data in the world, but I imagine with your resources it could be improved upon um, because you can, through the governor's office and docs, get the lists of pardons. They're obviously not publicly accessible, but mm -hmm. you can request the list of pardoned people um, from the governor's office, which we've been, through the New York Civic Engagement Table, have been doing targeted text banks and phone banks. Um, so I'm looking forward to collaborating. Any, any help that you could give us, we'll be looking forward to doing work together. Any questions? Yes, Councilmember Mayor Powell. Chair Thank Powell. you. Thanks all for being here and, and for adding <clears throat> your voice to this. I have a couple follow-up questions. Um, the first one, I just want to cover a topic we a little bit different than this one, but we had uh, the chair had asked earlier, Chair Cabrera, this is maybe for Citizen Union uh, more than anybody. There was an issue that he had raised, which is a good issue around uh, the mayor's office noting that poll workers pay, something that you guys have talked about in terms of poll worker access, um, had not, there was an announcement made in late April, uh, August that had not been actually followed through in September around um, increasing pay for poll workers. Do you have any information on um, or have you guys heard s similar uh, uh, reports and any information you have about um, from the, maybe the administration about when that might happen? They did not. Um, not offhand, but I could absolutely 
follow up and get back to you or your council about that Great. tomorrow. Thank you. I know something you guys had have advocated for in the past. Um, from the Brennan Center, you had a, a stat in here that uh, a thousand new uh, folks who were eligible out of the test 24,000 that were uh, uh, pardoned plus whatever the monthly count was um, had been registered in time for the September primary. Can you tell us how you were able to put that number together? Yeah, it's not easy, but basically um, we've, using the parolee lookup, been able to figure out who's been granted a pardon, and then we we regularly request a copy of the voter file from the state of New York, and we run them against one another to figure out who's getting registered to vote. Um, it It's a time-consuming process that someone who knows far more about computers than me handles. Some poor soul. Uh, <laughs> and um, so you're taking data that you get from the, the, the state voter for a file. Yeah. And then what's the data you're getting that lets you go look up? The who? parolee lookup website that I referenced earlier that indicates whether someone has been granted a pardon. It's a one by one record, but you can figure out who has been granted a pardon and then run that list against the voter file to see whether any of those people have ended up. Can you just pull the list up? Uh, I'm just curious about this process. Can you just pull up? The, the whole list? list? Of, no. So you have to go person by person and see if they've been part, every voter in New York State? No, everybody on parole. Everybody on parole. So, oh, so then what, yeah. we can compile a list of everybody on parole that's gotten the pardon, but that's a one by one process. Then, so, then once we have that list, we can run it against the vote file um, and figure out who's, who's I got it. registered. Okay. Got it. So about a thousand under your, under your uh, math, about a thousand had been registered to vote between I guess April 18th and s September. It, it was a Sunday this year, I think. Uh, August. I don't remember what. It was. Okay. August Got it. So 20. a thousand new voters in the last those th that yes. four month period. Got it. And what? And we're going to continue to monitor that. And I, I imagine, given the sad numbers of registration and turnout for the primaries generally in New York, that those numbers will hopefully go up in advance of November. Um, but. Yes, I was going to ask you if you had done any um, analysis of how that fits into other trends about how people re registration vote, uh, registering to vote. So there's there is some research not that has not been done in New York. We're working on some of this research now, but there's been research done on registration and turnout rates among people who have um, been previously disenfranchised um, in other states, uh, and generally the numbers are really really low. Not surprisingly, um, you know, on the order of uh, ten percent. Um, I want to say that's 10% uh, turnout rather than registration, but I could be getting that wrong right now. But it's, it's far below what you would expect, both among the general population and even if you control for all types of other socioeconomic factors that might um, suggest that that might otherwise make someone less likely uh, to get registered, it's always lower for people who have previously been disenfranchised. And that's not a surprise, but uh, we're hoping that at this moment in New York when things are changing and there are a lot of people who are interested in actually doing the work to get people registered that we might be able to uh, change that outcome in New York right now and that, that's why we're excited about this type of uh, legislation. Got it, thanks. And have you been able to look at, you said 24,000 in May, where I have 34, I mean, is that the right number? The, uh, I, it's 30. sort of complicated to give what the, the denominator would be, but um, it, it was 24,000 in May. The number I last saw was 30,666. I think Isabel said 30,676, so maybe she has Who were eligible. Who, who have been pardoned. Who have been pardoned, okay. Right. So, um, and then what, what is the monthly, what is the rate monthly? So, what I've heard from the governor's office is that somewhere around 1,000 to 1,200 people go out into parole every month. Um, so that would be the denominator. But some of those folks, so every month there's a chance that there's going to be people who's Pardon that, pardon that had previously been granted will be revoked because it's a conditional pardon. And so if you end up back in um, custody and or, or you're convicted of another crime, then you're going to lose that again. Um, so that number fluctuates a little bit. And even among the people who go out on parole, there's going to be some who are, you know, there, there are actually people who docs refers to as incarcerated parolees, um, which is a term that confuses me. But they're not going to be getting the pardon. So out of that 1,000 to 1,200, I'm guessing the number is a little bit lower than that. But I, I, but I would guess that something just shy of 1,000 people are going to be getting pardoned every month. And from those numbers, you feel like the it's an adequate uh, uh, amount of people that are are not just granted it, but are are, are actually becoming eligible. Not in the, in the total of the total pool that are actually becoming eligible. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we would obviously prefer that the state just pass a bill that says everybody on parole has the right to vote, and so it's not adequate. But given what the governor can do using his pardon power, I think that it is, you know, he's he's doing what he can currently. And his executive order power relative to legislature. Um, great, thank you. And the question in front to, um, there was a comment in one of the testimonies about, um, about, uh, 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 about the uh, misinformation that's been giving, that's given on like posters in the dorms of Rikers Island and other places. Can you um, tell us, just define that for us what that wrong information is and also the recency of when that information was seen and deemed to be, uh, deemed to be, somebody had a tough time, uh, deemed to be uh, out of, you know, providing misinformation? Yeah, I was actually, I. It was probably around a few weeks to a month ago, I was at Rikers Island and someone who I was registering to vote walked me up to this poster that was, being, that was hung up in the dorm that said the same information that Rachel read that's on the Board of Elections website. If you're in prison or on parole, then you can't vote. So it was like September maybe and it was, uh, saying that that, that uh, a parolee still could not vote. Correct. Yeah. Okay, got it. So DOC is still here. We'd ask them obviously to take a look at uh, the information provided. We'll 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 do a follow up with them on it. Um, that's all I got. Thanks. Actually, I want to follow up with a question that maybe a question that I had. Maybe you you already have the answer to uh, regarding his idea of doing a mailer. So you do have, you do have the thirty thousand list. You do know who's registered to vote. Therefore, we know their addresses. We could do this mailing. Do you think it would be advantageous for elected officials if that list was given to elected officials uh, for them to do a, a mailing? And the, then the follow-up question: If it's yes, would you be willing to share that? The the problem is that we the the data on who is on parole doesn't contain addresses. So the only way we have it's difficult to do a list that will give us everybody who's on probation or parole that has that also has addresses in it. Obviously, if they get registered to vote, then we have their address. But then that's not the population that you're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. um, we we may be able to construct a list, but I. I can't say definitively what we could give you and how thorough it would be. Um, I think people who do people who are doing the voter registration drives are relying in part on lists that um, the New York Civic Engagement Table has of that they use to reach out to voters, which may or may not be accurate with regard to addresses. So I don't know how targeted you can get. I, I do think there's something to be said for the idea that given you might not be able to be perfectly targeted reaching out to as many people as possible and hoping that you, you know, therefore spread the word widely and loudly and you can reach. It shows our list that is used. By the way, we do, we get funding for two mailers a year. That's it. So right. a lot and of people voter, think that. Those are registered voters. So you're Yeah, all those are registered voters. Yep. So they're not even, you know, and they're in the scope of uh, the targeting group. So um, that, that we're looking at right now. So that's the challenge. But if you do come up. I'm certainly willing to, to, to continue a conversation about what we can put together. I just think there's going to be limitations. The, the, we're, we're working with information that we get through public records requests. And so while they, they're thorough in some respects, they're, they're not going to be like perfect lists of, with addresses and all that kind of thing. Right. There's no more questions. We'll go to the next panel. Thank you so much. Very helpful. The last panel. Okay, the last panel. Perry uh, Grossman from a NYCLU, Lionel Auguste from Legal Action Center, and Anthony Posada from the Legal Aid Society. And you can begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you.
Who would like to be first? You are such a gentleman. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the chairs and the council members for holding this hearing uh, on a very important issue, as we have heard from the prior panelists who have spoken about the importance of these, these bills being introduced. Uh, what I want to start with is to contextualize us, uh, raise a quote from Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow about the importance of this issue. Uh, Jarvius Cotton cannot vote like his father grandfather and great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather, he has been denied the right to participate in our electoral democracy. Cotton's great-great-grandfather could not vote as a slave. His great-grandfather was beaten to death by Ku Klux Klan for attempting to vote. His grandfather was prevented from voting by Klan intimidation. His father was barred from voting by poll taxes and literacy tests. Today, Jarvius Cotton cannot vote because he, like many black men in the United States, has been labeled a felon and is currently on parole, end quote. So that's directly from Michelle Alexander, and I know that right now we're operating in a context where Governor Cuomo's executive order now allows people on parole to have their rights to vote be restored, but there are still immense barriers that people are facing when it comes to actually being able to register to vote and to access voting information, and I can speak to the initiatives that were mentioned earlier today that Legal Aid has been spearheading, that has been involved with, even before DOC announced a partnership with the Mayor's Office and the Legal Aid Society and other local civic engagement offices, because we were already doing some of this education and voter drives at Rikers Island prior to the mention of this initiative. So back in 2016, we had reached out to DOC and had gone into many of the facilities and many of the posters that we created back in 2016 are the same posters that are lingering in some of the facilities which we have asked to be taken down and to be replaced with the updated materials that we created and that still hasn't taken place even with the announcement of this initiative because I have not gotten a call from anybody to talk about the initiative. I have been coordinating with the Department of Correction which as you just saw was not even sure about how far the initiative have, had reached because to be clear, the initiative has not reached the borough-based facilities as of yet. We have not been to Brooklyn Detention or to Manhattan Detention Center. We are looking to get there by next week, but we haven't gotten there yet. And let's just talk a little bit about those numbers and also contextualize those numbers in relation to the quote I just shared. 90% of the, roughly 90% of the people in New York City jails are people of color. 80% of the people who have been disenfranchised by, in New York State are black and Latinx. With those two numbers, you can understand that what is happening here is that history is repeating itself and the same parallels of disenfranchisement that existed historically are existing today. And so, 421 people registered since we started the initiative in August 6 in a population of thousands and thousands of people who are eligible to vote is not even scratching the surface. It's not making a dent with what could really be happening where DOC as well as the BOE can be doing more so that they can really be changing the status quo and be serious about enfranchising people because we support the bills that, be, that are being introduced here, but we have to provide information, allow people to register to vote and access materials to voting regardless of their status. And somebody pointed out that, I think it was Sean from the Brennan Center that even as some of the bills are written, providing information upon release is not enough, right? We have been doing the initiative, but DOC is already working with people who are detained at Rikers and can be providing them information and not just specific counselors, but all counselors across the board providing this information to people on a regular and ongoing basis, not just months before prime general elections, but every a sustainable program that allows people to actually access these materials. So, some of those re requests 
or suggestions that we would have is that the Board of Elections could assist eligible voters in city jails registering to vote. This is within their purview and responsibility to eligible voters, and this is not something that is happening. They can provide voters on Rikers Island with materials that are actually in their language. On the day or prior to the day of the elections, the board of, we would say that the Board of Election can be going there to assist people with absentee voting so that they don't have to wait for the very last minute, and especially not to have to deal with the barrier by that time limit that's created where if it's not provided on a certain date, then you are no longer gonna be voting. With respect to the Department of Correction, they do, they have the resources, and as I just pointed out, they are, they are at Rikers. They can have counselors, not just in specialized units, trained and ready to register people and answer questions for those who have or need assistance to get registered. They can work alongside other agencies like the BOE so that they can provide on-site distribution of materials and again, bring many of the information of candidates that you mentioned, council member, earlier because it could be given and nothing is preventing them from actually handing out that information because if we have seen anything, every time I go to Rikers to register people, well, the first thing that always comes up is this, I, I can't vote because I have a felony, which is not true. I can't vote because I'm here at Rikers, which is also not true. And if, if we get past those hurdles and people finally do register, they'll say, well, who am I voting for? I don't even know what's out, I don't even know what options are out there. And so Legal Aid, we are a bipartisan organization. We don't go in there recommending anything in particular, but again, nothing is preventing DOC or BOE from providing information about the candidates and what are the platforms so that people can make an informed decision. Because as has been pointed out by the council members throughout this whole entire hearing is that there is just an immense amount of misinformation, especially with people who are just involved about what their rights are. Prior to these initiatives, the Legal Aid Society has been doing New York, Know Your Rights trainings at Rikers Island from issues uh, that span what are my rights when I get encountered by a police officer to what are my rights currently as I'm incarcerated, even post-conviction for my appeal. And there in every single instance, people are confused about right their, what their rights are and it's incredible to think that you can give a mini law lecture in an hour or two. So voting and, and the importance that voting plays in our society should be something that DOC is already doing where it's built into their active programming so that the initiative doesn't rest on the shoulders of volunteers or other organizations like NightClue or, or National Action Network or just people who out of their kindness of their soul want to come and assist people to register because they have the resources, they are already working with the people there and the onus should be on them to provide this kind of programming and information. So again, it's not just the Legal Aid Society providing this information to the DOC. And for them to actually come through with what they promise. And if they have said that they want to be in this initiative and take it to the next level, we have already should have had posters with the information of who can vote and what are, their, what are the conditions for voting for people who are on Rikers. Not a situation where people are referring to flyers with, that already have information that's outdated and that's actually incorrect. And so I've provided my written testimony where I outline many of these suggestions and recommendations so that we can be serious about enfranchising justice involved people because you all have the power to do that and if we are to change the status quo in this Jim Crow era of mass criminalization, then it, it should begin by restoring people with the, their rights to vote in society so that their voices can be heard because right now their voices are not being heard, are being suppressed and they're not given their constitutional rights to vote. So thank you all. Hello, my name is Ronald Oglesby. I'm the current educational coordinator as well as legal assistant at the Legal Action Center. Oh, it's not on. Okay, there we go. Uh, the Legal Action Center is the only public interest law and policy organization in the United States whose sole mission is to fight discrimination against the against and protect the privacy of people in recovery from drug dependence or alcoholism, individuals living with HIV and AIDS, and people with criminal records. The center, which is based in New York City, works tirelessly to combat the stigma and pre prejudice that keep these individuals out of the mainstream of society. I'd like to thank the committee for organizing a hearing on the matter of voting rights for justice-involved people and proposing legislature to help ensure that all New Yorkers are aware of voting rights. For too long, 
People have been wrongly told that they cannot vote. They've been made to believe that their voices do not matter. To address voter disenfranchisement, perceived and real, the Legal Action Center decided to create a two-page pamphlet entitled Voting and Criminal Records. Um, I brought some copies and I'd love to share them with people. Um, our document, Voting and Criminal Records, dispels the myth that individuals with criminal records cannot vote. It outlines the many situations in which people with criminal convictions can vote and the limited instances in which they cannot. The pamphlet also discusses the governor's new voting restoration pardons enacted in April 2018 to ensure that people on parole or post-release supervision have the right to vote in local, state, and federal elections. Our office sent the PDF of this pamphlet to the offices of every city council member prior to the recent state primaries. We urge you to share this document with your constituents to ensure that they know their rights. An additional impetus for the creation of voting, restoration, and criminal records was informed by Legal Action Center's direct services, and specifically my work as a legal assistant. In this position, I regularly speak to clients with criminal justice involvement, looking for guidance on numerous topics, ranging from who's allowed to access their criminal history to how they can obtain their civil rights, including voting rights. Um, these commonly asked questions in turn guide Legal Action Center's focus regarding which topics to address through our client education series and efforts, as well as our policy advocacy. Legal Action Center has seen the confusion regarding voting rights of individuals on parole for years. This confusion was most recently highlighted in a September 12, 2018 article by The Appeal, a national criminal justice focus news site. The article entitled, In New York, most parolees can now vote, but many county websites say they can't. Ask why more than 50 New York County level Board of Election websites state explicitly that parolees do not have the right to vote. This reality is particularly troubling given Governor Cuomo's May 2018 announcement of conditional pardons granting voting rights to most parolees. The article further explained that parole officers were instructed to provide information about the conditional pardons and voter registration forms to individuals they supervise. Legal Action Center knows firsthand that community supervision staff are frequently unaware and do not have the correct information about the voting rights for those they supervise. And we believe this general lack of understanding on voting rights coupled with the misinformation posted on Board of Election sites and other websites and information in the media leads to more confusion among those on parole. Legal Action Center works to educate its clients on issues of importance to them. We believe this issue is of the utmost importance. Legal Action Center has been involved in community events over the years, including partner partnering with the Honorable Milton Adair Tingling and New York County Lawyers Association to provide its 2016 voter registration drive. At this event, the Legal Action Center summarized at least 100 New York State rap sheets to help attendees determine whether or not they'd be eligible to vote. With the creation of this pamphlet, Legal Action Center's goal is to continue our tradition of educating and advocating on behalf of justice-involved individuals regarding their rights. We're extremely proud of this publication and have been told by colleagues that this pamphlet is the definitive guide because of the detail it provides. We're wholly committed to getting this publication in the hands of those directly impacted by the justice system, as well as others in workforce development, job training, and other set settings to help people overcome criminal record barriers. I thank you for this opportunity to speak today and hope that the necessary measures will be taken to address this matter. Before ending, I would like to share an email forwarded to Legal Action Center by a colleague at Center for Community Alternatives Incorporated <coughs> from a client they share our publication with. Parole officers are required to notify parolees when their rights to vote have been restored. Unfortunately, whether done intentionally or just neglectfully, not all parole officers do. My parole officer never informed me of the restoration of my right to vote, so I was under the impression that I had not been included in the governor's pardon. After reading the pamphlet from the Legal Action Center, including your recent email, I logged in on the parolee lookup website and discovered that my right to vote was indeed restored. I'm, regist I'm registering to vote tonight. Hopefully the above email leaves you with he leaves you all with a better sense of just how important it is to guarantee we find a solution for informing justice-involved individuals of their voting rights and much more. And also that while at times baffling, this is not insurmountable. 
Uh, the proposed legislation will also help further this objective. We hope that the council will enact these important bills and we're ready to work with the council in any way that we will to help further the goal of ensuring that every New Yorker is able to have their voice heard. Okay. Thank you all for having this hearing today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's late and this has been going on a while, so I'll do you the courtesy of being brief and being blunt. Um, read the, the prepared remarks. They're good, they don't add a lot to the discussion we've had already. People have said a lot of things about the bills. They're good bills, right? Everything you can do to help people involved in the criminal justice system vote is good for everybody. It's good for the, for the people involved in the criminal justice system because voting is, is a categorical good. It's good for the law enforcement officers who work with them because they're less likely to cause trouble. And it's good for the community because you have more people who have a stake in everything, right? So I am all in favor of these bills because they do the right thing they're a step in the right direction, and I'm gonna come back to this theme in a minute. Do more. Do more, start here, but do more. I, I wanna take a second to give Anthony a lot of credit, right? This is, um, I am a litigator most of the time. I'm incredibly tired right now because I've got the census case going to trial uh, over on Pearl Street in a couple weeks. I've got another case that's killing me right now up in White Plains, and so forgive me if I'm a little short. Um, you know, what Anthony's been doing to, to, to organize volunteers at Rikers, I mean, he, he got me involved with that. We at NYCLU have been sending more volunteers their way. And it is, it is really, it's an eye-opening thing in two different directions, right? On the one hand, you've got people who are actually reaching out and talking to people who are detained right now about their political views. You know, why should you vote? Why is this important to you? What does it matter that there are, you know, Supreme Court judgeships on the ballot. What does it matter if there are DAs on the ballot, right? People who are in detention don't necessarily feel a sense of efficacy, and here, here are volunteers coming in and saying, you can vote, you're a member of society just like the rest of us, you get a stake. I think it's also very powerful for the volunteers who go in, right? They get to see what is it like to be someone who doesn't feel like they have any power. And in the end, this is a drop in the bucket. I think on, on August 6th, you had, what, six volunteers? You know, we were sending vans in with 12 volunteers into a facility that has 9,000 inmates. 421 registrations in the course of a couple months is, is impressive, and it's nothing, right? You gotta integrate registration, you gotta integrate voter education into the programming. I think letting volunteers go in to Rikers is great. I think it's great for the volunteers, I think it's great for the inmates, but ultimately, this has to be a systemic thing because we're not gonna get the full benefits for everybody unless we're looking at integrating registration into programming. Setting up, you know, not necessarily a poll site because anything involving the Board of Elections starts to be a, I'll choose my words carefully, difficult. Um, but to instruct the Department of Corrections and to provide them with the resources to give incarcerated persons an environment in which to cast their absentee ballots with security and privacy and a sense that, that their votes count as much as anybody else's, I think there's real, there's real merit in there. Um, the bigger issue and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm glad the committee is taking this on and that I want you to do more and I want you to think bigger is we're facing some very, very serious challenges um, at the federal level, right? We have a nominee up for the Supreme Court right now, and if he gets confirmed, um, I should really think of twice about dismissing a bunch of my voting rights cases. I'm the senior staff attorney for the Voting Rights Project at NYCLU. I work with the Voting Rights Project at ACLU, and I don't want to see our win percentage go down, but I'm a little nervous. Um, Congress isn't necessarily a whole lot of help right now. The state legislature has been recalcitrant. The New York City Council is an incredibly powerful body. It can make a lot of change. It can do a lot of things with a very large voting population, right? We have in our Constitution the first sentence of the Bill of Rights, no member of this state shall be disfranchised, right? You have an opportunity here at the New York City Council to take a lot of measures to put that into effect and to make sure that Article 2, Section 1, right, every citizen in this state shall be entitled to vote. You can make that happen. So. What my hope is, is that this is the start of the city council taking the initiative where Albany has fallen off, 
or Washington is falling off and say, we're going to be leaders. We are going to take our position and, and, and show the rest of the country that New Yorkers vote and we're a better city for it. And we're going to make it as easy as possible for everyone to cast a ballot. So I thank you for doing this. And if I could ever answer any questions for you guys, just let me know. Uh, before uh, we continue, I just want to let everyone know, if there's anybody else who would like to testify, feel free to see the Sergeant of Arms. I'll be more willing to, to help you fill out uh, the little slip so you could testify. Um, I just have one, uh, actually a couple of questions. One is in relationship uh, to uh, the websites. Did, did I hear you right? How many websites did you mention? Fifty websites for um, in New York State. Fifty Board of Education websites that incorrectly list that people that are currently on parole can't vote. Yes. So uh, thank you for that number. It's the first time I heard it uh, today, uh, which is a significant number. Uh, the second question related to that is, uh, and is it was mentioned twice here already. The Board of Election. Have any of your groups here today that you represent? Have you happened to contact the Board of Elections to let them know uh, or, and or including the rest of the other websites? I'm just curious. So the way I, I went about asking if D BOE, so I, Legal Aid ha has not personally asked BOE, okay. but in working with DOC, we asked, can we do these things? And their response was, we, the Board of Election won't do it. We, they, we have been in contact with them and this is what they've told us. So thank you for making me realize that we could have reached out to them and will be doing so because we're not satisfied with that answer. But we have been told by the people who are like the front lines of this initiative that they already did the conversation and that it's not gonna happen. And, and Anthony, thank you for that because I, look, to be honest with you, today was the first day that I heard about uh, you know, the Board of Elections website, you know, having the erroneous information. So uh, I, the only reason I mention is so we could all do it a concerted effort. Uh, and I'm asking my colleagues to join in that as well and also all the advocacy groups. So I really appreciate, you know, I, uh, you know once they start getting all these phone calls, uh, I think they'll be, it'll be more expeditious in terms of their response. Question, Councilman Yeager, any question? No? Okay. Oh, thank you, you always surprise me. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I appreciate your testimony. Uh, we we'll definitely, definitely will be looking over it. And again, if you have any more suggestions, feel free to reach out to any of us. We really appreciate that with that today. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I just want to know for the record that we did invite the Board of Elections to be here today. They did not join us. Um, and we thought it was important that when we talk about issues about access to voting, polling places, numbers, state, you know, if efficiency is uh, to improve, things like that, that they be here. I think we still feel strongly they are a big part of this conversation. And we did just want to be on the record saying that we did invite them to be here today. That's absolutely correct, and uh, they'll definitely be hearing from us, that's for sure. Thank you so much. With that, we conclude today's hearing.